in the barzakh the spirit now becomes dominant the ruh becomes dominant and the body becomes subordinate because in some people they don't even have bodies they've been com decomposed they've been um what do you call it uh, cremated they've been consumed whatever the case is so the soul becomes primary in this case the ruh but the bodies will also share in the experiences of grief torment felicity joy and so on the spirits will endure this and the bodies will decay and gradually dissolve until the lowest lowermost portion of the spine remains from the from which the person will be recreated on the day of judgment i think it's called the coccyx i think it's called or the coccyx uh, i forget what it's called exactly or this could be which can hold some of the dna of a person because the person will be recreated the only exception to this the only people do not become decomposed by the ground the ground is forbidden you know to consume them are the martyrs those who have actually died fighting in the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a true battle and number two the prophets Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Sayyidil Mursaleen Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Baraka Wa Salama Tasliman Kathiran Ila Yawmiddin Amma Ba'd So we are going to be discussing the journey of the soul The journey of the soul in particular um, The journey of the soul means that it's only a soul uh, I mean it's a soul only for a short amount of time And Thereafter that, I'll mention all the verses, the Quranic verses to you, inshallah. So the soul is the soul uh, and only a soul when it starts off. So our first point of existence is purely as a soul. Thereafter that what happens is that um, part of that journey, we um, get connected to a body. And then we become the insan, we become the human being, right? And that's when we get ready to come into this world. Now, that's really only where we know ourselves, right? Currently, for anybody, right, that I'm speaking to or that we could speak to, they're going to, their reference point, their experience is going to be based on their experiences of this world so their whole idea is going to be their experiences of this world that is with a body right and that's got nothing to do uh, that, that that is not just as a soul on its own but it's a soul with a body now what's going to happen is that when we finish this world i'm just broadly speaking i'm just laying it out for you first when the soul when we end this world as i said in this world we are soul plus body before this world, we were just soul. There was no body. So when we come into this world or when we're getting prepared for this world through humanity as such, then it's soul plus body. Then when we die, there's a body and then there's a soul, but they become kind of disconnected, but semi they still remain semi-connected. Okay. Thereafter that, in the hereafter, the soul and the body gets connected again. And thereafter, the, that the body and the soul will remain together for eternity. So let me clarify that again. We start off with just the soul, the spirit, the ruh, as you call it. We then connect it with the body. And the body is primary while we're in this world. The body is primary. The soul is secondary, but they're very strongly connected. Without soul and body being connected, we're not living human beings. Uh, us being living human beings, essentially, is defined as soul plus body. But just remember that in while we're in this world, the body is primary, the soul is secondary, right? But that doesn't mean that soul is insignificant. It is very significant. Then what happens is that we depart from this world. People die. They're either buried or they could be cremated or in any other way so what then happens is that the soul goes somewhere and the body is somewhere else if the body remains because the body generally gets decomposed so parts of the body particles of the body or whatever the case is but there is a disconnect and that soul where that that goes we will discuss that later right that goes somewhere and then we've got the body that's 
that happens in the grave that happens between basically when people depart from this world so they no longer are part of this world but the day of judgment hasn't occurred yet right so this is in that interim period which they call the period of the barzakh right it's the barzakh it's essentially an interim period between this world and the beginning of the next world and that's going to last uh, so people who've died thousands of years ago from Adam alayhi salam until today and people who will die right now all right all of these people have gone into this intermediate realm they've entered into this chasm this uh, um, what they call the barzakh it's like a interim intermediate realm and that is long or short just by experience based on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was up. Now, that, that is hundreds, thousands, millions of years, depending on when people died from a worldly perspective. But the experience of a person in there is going to depend on their deeds of how long it's going to seem and what their state is going to be. So that's the intermediate period where the soul has been separated from the body, but there's still a connection. Right. Thereafter that we get ris uh, we get awakened resurrected on the day of judgment and the body and soul comes together again there's a new body now it's not this exact same body there's a new body but with some of the same parts and the same soul comes together now we rise on the day of judgment and we have the gathering we have the reckoning the questioning and then eventually the decision is made for paradise or hell now from this period onwards the soul will never leave the body it will always be together there will be no death after this death will be sacrificed so death is what separates the soul and the body once it comes together then it's paradise or hell may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all paradise now um <clears throat> that's the overall 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 picture i'm gonna break each one of these realms down and we're gonna discuss them individually so that's where you're gonna if you're wondering about where the where the womb part comes in the embryonic stage comes in i'm going to describe that to you okay and then we're going to break this world into several stages as well okay the idea is that um let us start with the uh, now i'm going to give some names here okay i'm going to give some names to these different uh, segments so the first one where the soul was just a soul when it was first created until it connects with the body that is called alamul arwah so arwah is a <clears throat> sorry Arwah is the plural of, of Ruh, okay? Arwah is the plural of Ruh, and Ruh means soul. So Arwah means souls, spirits. It's basically the, the, the battery inside us that makes us tick, that makes us alive. Otherwise, we're just a dead body. We're just, a, we're just a, an inanimate body. It's when the Ruh comes in that we become animated, right? We become human being and in turn. So <clears throat> initially, as I said, we were just ruh in alamul arwah. And what exactly happened? That's the first life, okay? Then what happens is that, uh, um, let me let me talk about this life first in brief. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first man, the first human being that was created was Adam alayhi salam. There were other creations of Allah. They say that the jinn, uh, the jinn world, the jinn um, uh, uh, kind as such they came before us right the angels were created before us the humankind human being uh, were created after the jinn uh, after the uh, after the jinn and now the jinn had caused a bit of corruption in the world so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first declared to uh, the angels or just declared in general i'm going to create this new being right the angels who are very pure creature uh, created originally from light all right they had seen they had they had had an experience with the jinn kind they said it caused a lot of corruption like what's the reason you know to create this other group of people uh, sorry another group of creation another creation who is going to shed blood and do all of these things and so on and whereas we are here already uh, um, glorifying you and um, and and doing your bidding and doing your deed and everything. So what what, what is the reason for this? Like why why are you gonna do this? What why what's the need for it? So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Inni a'lam, inni a'lam." You know, I uh, I know more right than what you know. So um, I have my own wisdom uh, for for doing this. Right. So what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala then does is that He creates Adam alayhi salam. 
Now, Adam salam, is created different from every other human being later. There's no other human being who came after Adam salam, that was created from no father or mother, from without a father or mother. So Adam salam, is the first insan, right, created from no mother or father, is created directly from the soil. All right. I just said earlier, angels are created from fire, sorry, from, from light. Uh, jinn kind are created from fire. And humankind are created from dust. Now, we kind of, some, at some level, we get it that we're created from dust. We don't, we don't, we've not seen the exact process of how that happened. But I think we generally kind of get that. A lot of people get that. But when they say that jinn kind is created from fire, like how does something get created from fire? What does it look like? Right? Likewise, how do angels get created from light? Light is like an intangible product. Right? You don't, you don't touch light you touch a light giving device but you don't touch light itself light is just something that you can see by all right so that's the origin of it it's like saying bread is created biscuits bread cookies are created from flour now you try to take that bread right or uh, or cookies and you try turning that back you give flour on one side now because we know and we've made bread or we've made uh, roti or, 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 or cookies. We know that those two things are, are connected. But otherwise, if you take once a flour is made into bread, there's no way you can turn it back. Right. Into. Into wheat. Human beings will turn back into dust. That's why we go back into the earth. So there, the, the, there's a special kind of light that the angels have created. That's why they're very fluid. They can take on different forms and so on. And likewise, uh, so can the jinn kind. But anyway, that's besides the point. That's not our point. Our point is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam. And he created him without mother and father. He took the soil from, he had an angel go and take the soil or go and pick soil from the different parts of the world because he wanted Adam alayhi salam to represent all human beings because the humans were going to be scattered and spread around the world. So Adam is made from soil from various different parts of the world. And that's why we have darker skin, lighter skin, uh, the different uh, features, characteristics, and so on. That's, that's why all of this is possible. The first angel that came, the earth said, I, you know, I, I'm not going to let you take soil from me. Uh, I'm not going to let you take anything of me. So, the it went back in fact it says i seek refuge in allah from you so the angel just went back eventually allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent uh azrael malakul maut the angel of death the, no death had happened he was not maybe even known as the angel of death at that time his name is azrael or israel right that's the hebrew name that he's known by right sent him and when the earth said the same thing he said, look, I've been commanded by Allah, so I don't care what you say. I've been commanded by Allah, right? And he took the soil from different parts. That soil was then mixed together, made into a 60-foot form. So Adam, according to the hadith, was not foot, 60 cubits, actually. A cubit in Arabic is called a dhira, 60 dhira. A dhira in Arabic essentially just means an arm uh, from, from here to the, uh, to the elbow. That's a dhira. Tell me how uh, how long is a dhira? Standard dhira. I mean, if you have a measure tape there, you can measure your own dhira. <clears throat> Essentially, it goes from about 43 centimeters to about 53 centimeters. My dhira is about 53 centimeters. Um, most people would be much less than that. I think the average is about 48 centimeters. Somebody can... I mean, sorry, you guys, Americans. I mean, I've forgotten my inches. I don't realize the inch. It's an arm length, exactly. But it's not from the shoulder. It's just this. A 60 dhira. It's about 48 centimeters. Just say about half a meter. So how many meters tall was Adam alayhi salam? That makes him around 29 to 30 meters tall. Okay. Now, somebody can... Um, uh, uh, so, uh, actually, forearm is just this part, so you won't include that. So I'm not sure what that. It's called a cubit in English, right? This part is called a cubit in English, all right? This to this is called a cubit. So the forearm is just this part, actually. That's the forearm. That's the palm. 
so uh, so that's the uh, that that's the hand so the whole arm is this right so that's the shoulder so it's a cubit so essentially 30 meters 29 to 30 meters that is about 98 feet not bad right that's adam alayhi salam that's why there's a hadith which says that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created adam alayhi salam in his feet sorry in his form which means in Adam Ali Salam's form that he did not go through the embryonic stage of going through, you know, uh, the, the small clot of blood and then that developing six weeks, seven weeks, limbs and so on, as you see, right? Uh, you know, in, in embryonic development. Adam Ali Salam was created whole, adult, and then the ruh was blown in. That's essentially what it is. 70, you know, uh, uh, 60 cubits or so. Then the ruh was blown in, and then from a part of Adam, uh, from from one of the ribs, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala extracted that and created Hawa alayhi salam. Hawa alayhi salam is actually the second person who's created from without a father or mother, like not again, not from an embryonic stage. I don't think, I don't believe that she came through an embryonic stage as well, right? But she was created from Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam created directly from soil. Hawa alayhi salam, Eve is created from Adam Alisam and from a rib, right? And there's reasons for that, which I'm not going to go into because we don't have too much time, okay? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you see, shaitan, uh, shaitan comes and looks at, hey, what is going on here? Who's this new, new creation, right? Created from soil. Um, uh, especially when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told all the angels and the, uh, and, and, and the shaitan to bow down. And shaitan is like, man, this guy's created from soil. I'm created from fire. I am not going to bow down to him. That's when shaitan got messed up. And you've heard that story. I'm not going to repeat that for you. But now what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did when he created Adam al -Islam, he had life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَنِي آدَمَ مِن ذُهُورِهِمْ, ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted, إِذْ أَخَذَ rabbuk, Your Lord extracted from the loins of Adam, from the back of Adam, Adam alayhi salam, all of his progeny that were ever going to come into being. So that's all of us. So if I look at the screen here, Kohinur Begum, Sabreen Saeed, Tami Fatima, Sabreen Saeed, all of you guys, I mean, that's only the names I can see. Sorry if I miss out your names. Myself, Sheikh Abdul Wahab, everybody. Our little forms were created, our souls were created after Adam Ali was created. And it says in the hadith that ex describes this, that, well, let me just read the verse. The verse says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted the progeny of Adam Ali from his loins, from his back essentially, and then uh, manifested himself to them, like th somehow he gave them a vision of himself essentially, right? And then he said to them, Aren't I your Lord? Alastu bi Rabbikum. Right? Alastu bi Rabbikum. Aren't I your Lord? And they've got, they don't know anything else. They all know that they've just come from this pure realm. They can't deny. They're not going to deny. This is innocence. This is what they know. They said, of course you are. That is you are. They, they knew Allah. There is no other awareness they have. They only have awareness of Allah. There's nothing that's uh, polluted them. That's why you see that babies find it so easy to believe in Allah. Uh, you know, you don't see Allah. You can't show them Allah, but they're willing to believe that. I've seen children, you know, who've been, you know, mashallah taught that. They go to the, the ocean. Who created this? And the child will say, Allah created this, not Power Rangers. All right. If you've taught them right. Children find it very easy. You don't find children denying God because they've come from the pure realm. They are so pure. They smell pure. Everything about them is pure. They've come from that realm, right? They come in a neutral state, but their inclination is that fitra, is the fitra that we're speaking about, the nature. That's what they're created on. They're not created on Islam. People say uh, everybody's born a Muslim. They're not. The word Muslim means the one who submits, right? The one who actively submits. So like, okay, I believe in God. Does Do people come? Uh, if you leave somebody, they don't necessarily all go, to, go in that direction. The hadith says every new offspring is born on the nature on the na i would translate it as actually natural faith i call this natural inclination because you've had that experience with allah right when allah manifested himself our souls have had that that's why we're willing to accept that the hadith then says that 
then it's the parents who shift them away from this nature, this fitra, right? And make them Jewish or Magian or Christian or modernist or liberal or American or whatever. I mean, uh, sorry, I, American is not against Islam, I'm just messing around with you guys. Now, the hadith then explains this in more detail that everybody, I mean, how do you get the billions of people? You know, it's a billions of people, Adam al Islam's progeny. So they were in the form of little ants, not ants, ants, but in that small size. And they all experienced that, uh, that uh, session with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, th these souls are going into an abode called the Alamul Arwah. Alam just means a universe, a place of, right? It could refer to time or space. In this case, the space, wherever, wherever the Arwah are, they all go there, okay? So now Adam al Islam is in the world, Hawa Islam is in the world, all her other souls, they are in this abode, world of souls. Okay? We don't have bodies yet, as I said. Now what happens is um, women become pregnant, right? They become impregnated, they become then pregnant, and that starts forming, a body starts forming, right? From the clot of blood, piece of flesh. Then it starts getting limbs, mashallah. It's an amazing system Allah has developed in our in ourselves. That all of that happens. Now, when it comes to approximately 120 days, the third trimester, right? That's your fourth month of pregnancy. After you know, if you've suffered from um, uh, what do you call those uh, uh, morning sickness and all that kind of stuff, while all of that is happening, may Allah bless women. May Allah bless our women. We came from women. You know, we marry women. Subhanallah, women are amazing. You know, I'm talking from a man's perspective. We have to respect our women. So they go through all of that. And at about 120 days, this is just a body. There's no life in there, right? There is no life in there. So now what happens is an angel comes. And there's a hadith about this right at the beginning of Sahih Muslim, right? From Abdullah ibn Masood, Allah, an angel comes. This is when our particular soul, from that abode of uh, souls where it was there hanging out with other souls, thousands of uh, millions of other souls, ours is chosen. Allah knows exactly which one is for what. Our body has, our mold has been created in the stomach of our mothers. That soul now is taken and connected. That soul is now coming into this body. Now we become a human being. Not in this world yet, still a soul, a hundred, about a hundred, it's never always exactly 100 there's difference of opinion but it could be slightly before that even a month before that it's around that time but by that 120 days that's going to happen the other thing is because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about us the de our decrees are written at that time and it's allotted allah already knows about it and it's in the divine tablet it's just allotted okay this is the guy now this is maria this is faiza this is sarwat this is you know abdul rahman this is abdul wahab you know this is it now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, I mean, let me tell you about this experience. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed sometimes that you meet somebody for the first time and you just hit it off? It's like you found it so easy, all right? You found it so easy to get along with this person. Like it just took you a few minutes. It's like you just connected. And then yet there's other people who you work with for maybe uh, three weeks, four weeks, and you find it difficult. You just like have an estrangement, an aversion or something, right? Do you, do you, do you see that experience? Okay. Now, um, why is that? The Prophet also explained. He said that, you know, in that abode of souls where souls are hanging out until they get connected to a body and they come into this world. If your soul was close to somebody's soul, you were like looking at one another, facing one another. I don't know exactly how that happens, but whatever it is. As the hadith says, whoever you recognize from your kind of group or people that were around you down there in the soul, when you come across those kind of people that were within close to you, you gain a familiarity, a friendship it's easy to develop. But where that doesn't happen, then you have an estrangement. You like find it more difficult. You have to make more efforts. So that's Alam al-Arwah. And now we, 
uh, the, this soul has become connected to the body. And then, of course, you go through the rest of the, the nine months or eight months if you're premature, whatever, and then you come into this world. Right? So now, let me explain that now there are five worlds that this human being, in terms of lives of human beings, are going to go through five different stages. And this ruh is going to go through five different stages. So the first stage, as you know, is alamul arwah. Okay? Um, now, I don't know if there is a, a whiteboard on here. I could have done it on there. Oh, but, but I mean, it's not that difficult. It's quite simple. The first stage was this abode before, before the embryonic stage, okay? Before the embryonic stage, it's just alamul arwah. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and put all the ruh in there, all the arwah in there, that's alamul arwah. That's the first abode. We have all finished that first abode. We've graduated from there. We have now entered the second abode. The second abode is the world. From when we're in our mother's stomachs, wombs, until we come into this world. That's the second, that's the second world that every ruh and every uh, soul will go through. Right. Then when we depart this world, we die, killed, whatever, God forbid, we die or leave, depart this world, we enter into the third world. That is the barzakh. Okay. That is what you call the intermediate realm. That's the third world, okay? It's significant enough called the third world. As I said in there, the soul is now separated from the body. It was only connected in this world. The vehicle is now gone. But we got a connection with one part of our body, some particle that's left in the earth somewhere. Still going to be a connection. That's why, if, that's why we believe that in the graves, if our body is there, we believe in... Uh, reward in the grave pleasures and we also believe in punishment because there is still a contact right and uh, then the fourth world is the day of judgment the resurrection the day of judgment out of the intermediate realm onto the day of judgment that's the fourth life the fourth world now on that as i said the soul gets connected back to the body then um the fifth life is paradise or hell. When the judgment is made and you go to paradise or hell, that's the fifth life. So broadly speaking, there are five lives or five stages that this ruh will go through. And as I said, in the first one, there's, there's just ruh on its own. After that, in this world, it's ruh plus body. But the body is primary. Then it comes to the intermediate realm. And then it gets onto the fourth level, which is the day of judgment. We're with a new body now, right? So this same body is not going to be there. It's going to be a new body uh, recreated from one part of our original body, whether that's DNA or whatever the case is. But it's going to be a recreation from our original portion of our body, part of our body. It's going to be a new body on that day. And then we go into paradise or hell. Now, in paradise or hell, the, the relationship between the soul and the body is that in paradise, every body is going to be approximately between 30 to 33 years of age. It doesn't matter when you died, at what age you died, right? Whether you died as a haggard old man or woman, all right? Or as a young boy or young girl, you're going to be 30, which is the prime of youth. You're going to say 33 youth. I'm getting to that. You're going to be the strongest in that strongest state. And you're going to remain in that age forever in paradise. Hellfire, something similar. I'm not going to describe that right now. Right. So, you know, in the intermediate realm, your soul becomes the primary and your body becomes secondary because your body is decomposed or whatever. So your soul becomes primary. In the hereafter, in paradise or hell, your soul and body are both primary. That's why you feel full reward and you experience pleasure more than you can in this world because you're experiencing it not just with your body, but with your soul as well. In this world, when we experience pleasure, we experience it primarily through our body, though our soul is included in there. But in the hereafter, it's going to be both 100%. It's just, I don't know what the experience is. Likewise, in hell, it's going to be the same problem. So we want to avoid hellfire, inshallah. Because in hellfire as well, the body and the soul will feel it the same way. And there's no dying in there. It's just going to be pain, pain, pain. May Allah protect us. Now what I want to speak about after discussing the five major stages is let us talk about the most important stage for us right out of these five stages which is the most important stage the third one 
the third one, we can't do anything. The third one, we're just left to whatever we've done in this world. Yeah, um, I guess it depends. The most important stage you could probably say is the last stage as to where we end up. But I think right now we need to be focused on the most important stage being the dunya because that is what governs everything. See, when Alam al Arwah, we were nothing. There's nothing we could do. We're just neutral beings there. When you come into this world, that's where all the other stage, the second stage, the second world, the second phase is what determines the third, the fourth and the fifth stage. That's why the second stage becomes the most important stage. Since we need to focus on this stage, and I think today we're only going to be able to focus really on this stage, right? Because it's the most, the, 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 the biggest stage and I think we need to focus on it so we understand our milestones. So inshallah, we can benefit ourselves. That's the purpose of this class here today. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this entire topic is we get awareness of who we are as a human race, why we were created, what stages we're going to go through, and what is the impact of these stages. That is the most important thing here. Right? So the Alam al arwa the Alam al-Dunya, the world, then the intermediate realm, Barzakh, then Alam al qiyamah the, the, the day of judgment and the proceedings. That's the fourth one. And the fifth one is paradise or hellfire. Right. Now let's go back to this world now. This world, as you know, we come through the embryonic stage. I've already discussed that. So when we now let's start from when we come into this world, we come into this world as infants. OK, we come into this world as infants. Now, what are the five major stages? There are now if we are just to take this second phase of existence, the second world, the most important world, the alam of dunya, that is that is the soul goes through five different stages in there. Not every soul, though. But souls in general, humans in general. Okay, remember now we have a body, so we are a human being now. All right, the first one, which pretty much everybody goes through, is the infant stage the stage of infancy and being a toddler. That's the first world. And the reason why we're separating this from when we grow up and become mature is because rules that apply to us, our responsibility and accountability, right, towards our creator, are change. This is, in one sense, the best of stages. It's the most innocent of stages. I'm going to mention it. I mean, I could mention it to you in general, but I'm going to mention it to you according to what Ibn al-Jawzi says. So just so Ibn al-Jawzi, one, uh, one of my favorite scholars, he was one of the great scholars, um, hadith scholar. He's got a tafsir. He's, got a, he's, he's a historian. He's an, a well-rounded, accomplished scholar, tried to become a very comprehensive person. And uh, he's a Hanbali scholar from Baghdad. And he died in uh, the late 500s. Right, the late 500, 500, I don't know, 70, 80, 90, something. So he says that this alam al dunya, this second part of our existence, is split up into five sections. Okay, the first section is childhood, infancy, being a toddler, and so on. Right, that is approximately until that, that is until maturity, and um, humans mature in terms of physical maturity, adulthood. Uh, according to Islam, you mature when you have either wet dream or onset of menstruation for, for girls, right? Or impregnation, and there's a few others as well, all right? But that is generally between the ages of 12 and 15, right? Islamic years. So the maximum after which by age you would have matured, even if you didn't have a, you know, uh, an experience of a wet dream or whatever, would be the age of 15. And that 15 is the, not Gregorian, but the, the Hijri calendar which is essentially 14 years and seven months from a Gregorian perspective. So when you become from what you normally count your ages, 14 years and seven months, if you've not had a menstruation, if you've not had a period or uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, dissemination or whatever you call it, right? Then you would have become mature by age. The importance of that is that you now become responsible. You, you, we are taken to task by Allah. We will be questioned about what we do now until now. You know, we could be, for, you know, we, we were innocent. If somebody died before that age, they, they would, according to the strongest living, be in paradise. They'd be going, going to paradise. There'd be no questioning. Okay. That's the first stage. The second stage then is youth. Now I want to ask you is when does youth starts at, as I said, between ages of 12 to 15, when does it end in your minds? When does youth end? MashaAllah, somebody's very generous. Sabrina is 40. Wow. Ahmed Kayyum has this really... 
particular number 22. We got a lot of people voting for 40. Unfortunately, this is not a democracy. So it's not going to happen. Okay, you're not going to get a I mean, you're not going to get a gift for this. Okay, let's stop now. It's actually 35. According to Ibn al Jawzi, now there, there could be differences of opinion here, but yeah, you, you somebody got it. 35. Okay. 35, 35, 35, 35. Mariam got it. 35. Okay. That is according to, as I said, that is according to Ibn al Jawzi. 35, you're still considered youth. Because you still have a lot of energy about you. It's only after 35 that you start going kind of a bit downhill. Anyway, that's the youth stage. The third stage then is from 35. It's called the maturity stage. So until 35, you don't become fully intellectually mature. They say that you actually put a properly where everything develops. The risk taking faculty of your mind and everything else when it takes, when it actually develops is at 40. That's when it becomes perfected. And that's half of your life. You've gone to the top of the hill now. Now you're looking over. That's when people have midlife crisis. I will discuss this, inshallah, later in a bit more detail. That's what you call, that's when people experience midlife crisis. All right? So this is called maturity. And they say that this extends from 35 when youth ends until 50. So it covers that 40 age, right? Between 35 and 50. Now when you get to 50, that's when the fourth life begins of this world. The fourth stage of this life in this world begins. And that is what you call seniority. Now, when does that end? Doesn't make a difference. You're senior now, right? So from the age of 40, it goes to 75. Sorry, 70, 70. And I don't think this is like a proper number. It's around 70 that you're seeing seniority. Because you know what? You know what happens after 70? Then he calls the next stage after 70. He's got a few names. There are a few names for it. It's called either haram, not haram, haram with a small hair, okay? Decrepitude, evil old age, seniority, uh, sorry, uh, senility, decrepitude, evil old age. A lot of people by the age of 70, then they start getting a bit senile possibly, right? And mashallah, many people are saved from that. The Prophet ﷺ made a special dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-haram. Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from evil old age. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min an uradda ila arda lil umur. I seek your refuge, Allah, from me being returned to evil old age. From senility, to being senile. Now, some people become senile a bit earlier. Some people don't become senile. So that is kind of up. But generally, let me just mention that uh, the five major stages of this world is firstly childhood until you, you physically mature, right? About 14, 15 years of age. Then the youth begins until you're 35. Okay. Uh, you're still at your prime. Then from 35 to 50 is your middle age, right? You call that maturity or middle age. And then from 50 to 70, right? is what you call seniority you're a senior now right and then above 70 and i said that's not a very that, that could be a bit fluid that's not definitely 100 percent there right is after that it's decrepitude and then after that what happens after what happens after that final stage what is the next one called after you know 70 to um sorry yeah 70 to whatever it is 80 90 100 120 what happens after that death you depart this world and now you're out of this world so that the life of this world is gone now okay now what's really interesting is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam talks about himself he says kuntu nabiyan wa adam bayn al ma'i wa tin i was a prophet when adam alayhi salam was still between the water and soil stage when when the so soul had not been breathed into him and blown into him and he was ju just his form had been created and I was a prophet. What does he mean by I was a prophet? The prophet Salaam wasn't physically alive. It just means that he was designated as well and his ruh was allocated as being the prophet's ruh. So now when Adam is given his life and he in his loins is the prophet Salaam's ruh as well. Now, the, the, the soul of the Prophet ﷺ travels down, right, through all of his forefathers, 
to all of his forefathers. That's why there is a transmission which says, وَأَنَّهُ هَبَتَ مَعَ آدَمْ حِينَ أَهْبَتْ وَكَانَ مَعَنُوْ حِينَ رَكِبَ السَّفِينَ Right? Um, the explanation of this is that the Prophet ﷺ is with Adam ﷺ when he's coming down from paradise. The Prophet ﷺ is with Nuh ﷺ. Because the Prophet ﷺ has already been designated as Prophet. None of us, even there's any discussion about us. But with the Prophet ﷺ, his name has been written on the Arsh and everything, even before he's been created. He's the only special creation of Allah, even from among all the Prophets. After Adam ﷺ, who's actually physically alive, the Prophet ﷺ then goes down. He is in the Ark of Musa uh, of Nuh alayhi salam. He is with Ibrahim alayhi salam and he's thrown into the fire. Eventually he comes down to Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib then passes it on the, 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 because he's, uh, be, uh, Abdul Muttalib is the grandfather. From him it passes, the Ruh of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passes or uh, the, the, the seed passes to Abdullah. Abdullah gets married to Amina. And there's even statements saying that when Amina became pregnant with the Prophet ﷺ, it was as if she had taken the light and there'd been a transfer of light. I mean, it's a seed. I mean, we all come from our parents. We all went through this. You know, we were in the, uh, in Safina, no, you know, our seed, we were in the ark as well, right? Except that the Prophet ﷺ just has a special status about it because he's already designated. And then, uh, and then Amina gives birth to the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Anyway, that's besides the point. Now, one thing about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, which I hope that if we, you know, inshallah, most of us can say that um, about where we came from. Uh, and if some of us cannot say that, then no fear. Inshallah, our progeny can say that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, kharajtu min nikahin. وَلَمْ أَخْرُجْ مِنْ سَفَاهِنْ أو سفاهن, سفاهن. I came, I was extracted and I came from nikah. That all my forefathers up to Adam السلام, were all married. I did not come from immorality. I did not come from an unchaste union. I did not come from vice. This is the purity of the Prophet وسلم, that all of his soul was, you know, was designated for him and ev all preparations were made. So every one of his forefathers, even though they may have been idol worshippers or whatever among them, they may have not been believers in Allah, whatever. But can you see the importance, right, of marriage and nikah and the repugnance, the ugliness of zina, of fornication that people take so lightly today? have no problem in illicit relationships it's like you know what's the big deal that's why i said that okay you know if we can't say we came from purity 100 percent, we don't know whatever inshallah inshallah we can our progenies that will come from us all the souls that are going to make up our progeny right inshallah they will be able to say that at least you know at least until us inshallah let me stop here. Let me stop here and uh, take questions because we're nearly up to the hour. So I'll take some questions. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, Ummu Abdullah, what did you read on Islam QA, Islam Web or whatever? What are you confused about? And uh, anybody else who has a question? Um, again, remember, I only want questions about what we've covered so far. Okay? Only about what we've covered so far so that we keep it on track, inshallah. Is our heart a connection to our soul? That's a very interesting, yeah, that's a very interesting idea or a question rather as to, you know, we have, we have the nafs, which is another faculty within us. We have the ruh and then we have a heart. Okay. So the heart is part of our body. Okay. That's uh, the heart, the physical heart, the cardiac heart that pumps the blood, etc., around our body. That is actually a physical part of the rest of our body. The ruh, okay. The spirit is beyond the heart. Right, it's connected to the heart, obviously. Okay, it's connected to the heart, but it is not part of the body. Just remember that it is not part of the body because the ruh is a separate. The ruh is essentially the way they describe the ruh is that it is a subtle substance, a subtle substance, right, which 
when it infuses the body, the body becomes alive. And when it comes out of the body, then the body dies. Just like, have you taken a fresh twig? So they describe it like a twig. You've got a fresh twig. Now, in that fresh twig, there is moisture in there. That's what makes it fresh. Now, have you seen a twig when it dries out? The, the reason it dries out is because there's no moisture in there. So our ruh is not moisture, but it just goes to explain that the ruh is infused with every part of our body. Okay? And it makes our body tick. Now, that's why they say, they say that when a dead person is oh, it's not a dead person about to die, when a person is about to die, the soul then starts coming out of the feet and then from the knees and above, above, above until it finally comes out. Right. Which basically means that part different parts of our body will become limp. So our soul is what permeates and infuses every part of our body and then makes it alive and kicking. All right. So it's separate from the physical heart that we have. OK, that one is done. Do, uh, do we have personality in the world of souls? I don't know. I don't think so, because there's not really much going on down there. Right. It's just like a, a place of reserve. It's like a waiting room. So I don't think we mess around down there because nothing's going to happen. Right. Uh, we obviously have personality that is designated for us. That's going to come out to us. Anyway. That's why. I, you know, if I compare myself to my brothers and sisters, right, who are all born and uh, brought up in the same house, you know, one of us may be more generous than the other. One of us may be more smarter than the other. One of us may get more angrier than the other. That's just what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is God-given personality. But I think that really, I don't think that um, it makes any difference in the, in the alam al-arwah, in the, in that world, it really matters only in this world. The, the soul exists when we are being formed in mothers. I said our souls have existed from before. Okay, our souls have existed from before. They get connected to uh, around 120 days to our embryo. That's when we become soul plus body. And now that's why abortions are not allowed after that in Islam. Okay, uh, what exactly is a soul? What exactly is a soul? It, it, I think I just explained that. When the souls were in the world of souls, did male and female soul meet? Is that why we feel connected with our spouse? I don't see why not that they could have met and they could be around. That's why you can hit it off with some people more than others, whether that be a male or female. That doesn't allow you that just because you feel a connection with a, you know, with a non-mahram woman that, you know, that you can, unless you get married. So the only way to justify that is to actually get married. Okay. Can you please clarify the portion? about the, how the person was passed from every his soul no it's not his soul it was his seed right just like our seeds there's nothing it is nothing like except that the prophet sallam, had a special designation already because he says in numerous hadiths that i was already designated as a prophet when adam Islam was still not yet even alive yet when only his form had been made so it's just an interesting idea about that that's all it's just an interesting idea about that. otherwise soul is uh I'm not sure exactly the soul of the Prophet ﷺ was probably in the Alam al Arwa itself, right? Yeah, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alunaka ani ruh, wali ruhu min amri rabbi, wa ma uti tum min al ilmi illa qalila. Okay, that's a very good question. So, you see, Ibn Abba, uh, the, the, the Jews, one of the questions that they, to, they uh, told the Meccans to ask is, What is the nature of the soul? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded that they ask about the soul, uh, say to them, that the soul comes from the command of my Lord, right? Min Amri Rabbi, and you've not been given, you've only been given a bit of knowledge, okay? That's why you don't know, that's why you've had this question. Now, there's two ways to understand this verse. One is that you can never understand the soul, and that is true. We're never going to understand the soul fully, right? But that doesn't mean that we, you know, we can't understand some basic ideas about it. It's very, very clear. Right, that the soul is what makes our body alive. Without the soul, our body is dead. So that's why they've described it as some subtle substance which infuses our body and makes it alive. And when it disappears, then the body becomes dead. That's our soul. But exactly what is it made of? You know, what does it look like? Can you recreate it? That's not going to happen. Okay, number one. The second interpretation here, as far as I know, it's from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu uh, or somebody else. And he said, we can describe it 
right? Because Allah says, you've only been given a bit of knowledge. So that was talking to the Jews that you've only been a gift, but we know what the soul is. And what do we know about a soul? Well, maybe what I've just described. But going beyond that to try to understand the exact composition, the chemical makeup, you know, that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Because I don't think anybody's captured a soul. Like, okay, let's capture a soul when a guy is dying. Let's put it in a bottle. And then we'll take it into a lab. Nobody's been able to do that. So we're never going to know that. But we can define it in at least our observation in terms of what we're saying. Okay. So hopefully that's clear. And let's see the next question. What is the connection between our dreams and our soul? Well, I mean, when we see a dream, dreams can be of several types. And one dream is basically that it comes from shaitan, which is the scary dream that is from shaitan to scare us. Okay. Now, how humans experience that dream, it is clearly they're experiencing it uh, from something which is still active while they're sleeping, which could be the soul. Okay. Which could be the soul. So exactly how that is, I don't know. But I can tell you that some dreams are given to us by the shaitan. To, to frighten us. Anything which is frightening, and the Prophet also told us how to deal with it. He said, just seek refuge. Don't tell it to anybody. Turn the other way. Spit if you have to in one direction. Just turn and go to sleep and never tell it to anybody. Now, the second type of dreams we have are Adghathu Ahlam, as Allah mentioned in the Quran. These are just scattered thoughts of the day. So this is just our mind, right? It's mainly part of our mind. Whether soul pit is part of that or not, I don't know. Because I think maybe the soul is needed to keep our mind in action. Wallahu alam. But it's our mind is just processing the thoughts of the day and then we get images in our minds. Okay. And the third uh, type of uh, dreams are the good dreams from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we meet awliya Allah, we immediately fall in love with them for Allah's sake. And sometimes we feel that we have already met them before. So is it possible that we've already met them and find that uh, same connectivity that we had earlier? You know, um, Zainab, what I would probably say is that that may be your experience, but uh, okay, what, my name is asking, what is awliya? Awliya is the plural of wali, which means friends of Allah, you know, really righteous people who have, uh, mashallah, accomplished and uh, become very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, uh, if I can use the word saints in a generic term, okay? Um, so th to be honest, that's your experience and the experience of many good Muslims, inshallah. But that's not necessarily the experience of everybody. There are many saints, uh, the biggest of our saints, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. People did not fall. Um, many people did, but there was Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, who did not like him at all. So I don't think you can use that as a, uh, I don't think you can use that as an example. Uh, I think what you're, I think what the experience is more telling us is that you, uh, you know, you and other people uh, who have this experience have a love for the religion. Okay. They have love for the religion. And when you see somebody manifesting that religion, you're, you, you are finding yourself familiar with that. You're feeling good about that. You're feeling comfortable with that. You have a familiarity with that. I think that's more about that. I don't think that's got to do with Alam al -arwa. I think the, the, that aspect is more to do with, you know, whether the guy is good or bad or whatever. You just feel this, like, you know, I know this guy. I can get along with this guy type of thing. Okay, so hopefully that provides a nuanced understanding, inshallah. What is the status of children who die before the age of puberty in the hereafter? I think I mentioned that before. There are about 10 opinions, but the strongest opinion I would believe, according to Imam Nawi and many others, is that these people will be in paradise as normal people, 33 years of age. But they will go directly to paradise. They, they don't have to be questioned. They don't, or they don't have to worry about the questioning and all of these other uh, challenges of the day. How can we feel connected to our soul? You're not that you just be connected to yourself, and that is if you do right and if you understand understand thyself, then I think you understand what you really are, and that's I think what we're doing today, is that if we understand who we are, and we, uh, Subhanallah, if we understand who we are, and then we find out what is good for us and what is bad for us, and what we are here for then we can help our soul to be successful. And I think that's what we're talking about, connecting with our soul, if that's the soul we're talking about. Um, we do talk about soul as nafs, which is another meaning, which is this faculty within us that is either going to assist us in doing good 
or that's going to assist us in doing bad, incite us to evil. That's the nafs, that's not the ruh. What we've been talking about until now in terms of the world of the souls is the ruh, the ruh, the spirit. We translate it as soul, soul sometimes. But we also use the word soul in English for this lowly soul, which is a faculty within us that we need to um, develop into being good as opposed to being bad, right? This voice inside us that is either prompting us to do something good or bad. That's what you call the soul and there. That's where that's the nafs, right? So that's a separate nafs. So um, hopefully I've answered your question, inshallah. If I haven't, then uh, be a bit more specific, inshallah, and I'll try to answer again. When we sneeze, where does our soul go to? Because I feel, I still feel alive, but people say our souls leave and come back. I'm not too sure about that one, right? And I'm not sure if that's the reason why you say Alhamdulillah, because your soul goes, I'm not really sure about that, right? Whether scientifically speaking or otherwise, you know, I, I'm not really sure about that. I, I know soul is created, but does the soul ever die similarly to body death? Okay, that you learn about when we talk about the third realm, but just mentioning it in brief, when a person dies, right? When a person dies, that means the body is going to be buried or the body is going to be cremated. For some people, the body is eaten by animals for others or whatever the case is. The soul separates. It still remains a bit of a connection, but the soul separates. Then what happens with the soul is that it depends on the soul. So if the soul is a good soul, then it goes to paradise. It goes to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Many souls go to the throne of Allah. If it's a, uh, we know of certain souls, like it says that the souls of martyrs, right, will be in green birds flying around paradise. And then there are some other examples. But the soul of bad people goes down to the sijin, to, to the bottom, right? And that's not looked on as very good at all. It's very despicable and so on. So it depends on the person's soul. Okay. It depends on the person's soul. Are the souls of special needs people who have mental disability different, purer or more innocent than the souls of neurotypical people? Is their soul different? No. If you're talking about soul as in ruh, it's the same soul, right? Because it's just what keeps you alive. That That is not the soul what I think you're referring to. You're talking about the nafs. So clearly, I would assume that people who are challenged, who are innocent because they can't use their rational mind to do evil, right? I believe that they are more childlike, you know, because we generally compare these people to, to children. We say they, they have like a child's brain and generally children's souls. What we Remember, let's not get mixed up in what we mean by souls, okay? So the nafs we're talking about, the faculty... Not what keeps us alive, but the faculty. That part is what uh, is considered to be, uh, what do you call it, probably more purer. Okay, probably more purer. Uh, the dream. Is this all partaking in the dream or is it hanging around in the heavens in a specific area? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, okay, when we visit graveyards, does our loved ones know we are there? Also, if it is a shaheed, will the soul still return to the grave for questioning or it remains in the uh, in the in the yin, I think that should be saying. So, um, yes, our deceased can hear us and we learned that from the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where after the, those guys that died in Badr, he spoke to them and he said, Didn't, did you not find what Allah has promised you to be true? And people started saying like, why are you speaking to dead people? He says, don't think that you can hear better than they can. You know, they can hear. So that's why we believe that um, deceased people can hear if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to hear is a possibility. So when we go there, we can actually speak to them. You're probably not going to get a response, but you can actually say things that, you know, uh, I mean, don't tell them your whole life story. That's just, you know, it's just maybe, you know, you can say I'm making dua for you. You can say stuff like that if you want to. Okay. And uh, whether the Shaheed's soul... Um, I'm not sure if they come back. I don't know if they need to come back. Uh, they are guaranteed paradise. So I don't know if they need to come back. But they, as I said, they don't need to come back. There's a semi-connection between the two anyway. But as I said, the soul is more primary. The body is secondary. The questioning is happening. And there, there's a still a... They're not separated out like there's no connection at all. There's still a connection. It's like a wireless connection or whatever the case is. All right. Okay, Jazakallah Jariya for that. Um, what... If your soul carries a lot of emotional baggage when you die, 
your soul can't carry i mean depends on what you mean by soul your soul as i said is just what makes your body tick all right it's just what keeps your body alive so i don't think that that's going to happen okay um if you're talking about just your own self your mind your heart i think you're talking more about your mind and heart but then you're dead now i mean i, I don't know what difference that's going to make in the hereafter our hereafter is going to be judged based on the summation of our life our good and bad and then the ending of our life and may allah make that good inshallah but it's not it the, it's it's about whatever you know whatever's going to happen whatever has happened in our life it's going to be the sum of that so i don't think it makes any difference so we can do anything about it afterwards anyway okay seeing dead people in dreams are the soul trying to communicate with the living or is it just thoughts allah knows best it could be anything right it could be that allah wants us to know something um it could be uh, you see sometimes when a person has to be woken up and awakened or uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may cause us to see a loved one in our dream because that's going to be a lot more emotion powerful than if we see something else all right do you understand so it could just be that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing it. it doesn't mean that that person is coming along and telling us something it could be anything um so don't get too excited about those things right and if you do see kind of unusual things then uh, just go and contact uh, a sheikh about that how aware is a soul when death is about to come does the individual know about they can't state it it uh, most people will not know uh, well many people will not know a lot of people do know uh, for example my mother she passed away about 10 years ago may allah have mercy on her and bless her uh, she we had taken her to hospital because she had cancer and she she was suffering a bit so we took her to hospital she was there for about 3 4 days they did not want to release her until she became more settled but she wanted out and she just kept saying for the whole day take me home take me home take me home and finally we said you know what let's just take her home we took her home from that time she never said a word and then after that the next morning she passed away i believe and there's in fact there's another uh, person we know who said a few days before uh, uh, that okay let me sort all of this my accounts out let me sort this out i need to pay this but whatever he sorted it all out and after 2 to 3 days he died so i believe that people sometimes know without realizing they know and they do certain things allah makes them some people and then there are people who actually do know okay while the quran says that nobody knows that's in general that nobody can claim to know but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reveal it to certain people that you are going to die like he did to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was given that choice all right and and others we've had that experience from people where uh, in fact some people have had, even had the experience of meeting or being visited by the angel of death that i'm going to be coming to you in 3 days okay but remember this is the far and few in between people right and this is just a special karama of this okay now if somebody claims it you know we don't have to believe them it's not going to make any difference so uh, that's the thing now if there's a trustworthy individual who's saying that you know it's not beyond the realm of impossibility let's put it that way uh i would love to know when i'm going to die just so i can be prepared okay may allah allow us to be prepared before i die Uh, do souls communicate in the barzakh with each other i don't know but i would assume that that may be a possibility for some people allah may give that possibility for some people for what reason i don't know they're not running a business there they're not doing anything down there but as ibn al-qayyim has mentioned as well that the prophets for example and the uh, the prophets and also the 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 martyrs they are alive in their grave okay in fact uh, this hadith would say that the prophets are even praying in their grave okay so um There, there 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 are these possibilities um when we die will we meet our loved ones in the barzakh or just lie in the grave till the horn is blown allah knows best allah knows best there's nothing that uh, states that you will meet your loved ones so we're going to say that by default that would be the case uh generally what we uh, what is mentioned about people in the grave uh, or or in the barzakh is that they if they're good people they will be told to sleep like a bride just relax and go to sleep and a door to paradise will be opened up the grave will be expanded and you'll just be in like a five star seven star luxury resort just relaxing just relaxing there's nothing to do all right now whether there's some communication that goes on or not allah knows best okay allah knows best i don't think it's a, it's something that we need to really get into as such um 
I know soul is created, but does the soul ever die? Okay, that one. The soul die, the, everything will perish. Everything perishes in um, after the after everybody dies, after the, the trumpet is blown, and we'll de deal with that, inshallah, after the trumpet is blown, okay? After the trumpet is blown, then everything perishes. The body, the soul, and everything. And that's the opinion that I, I, I recall. So the soul will die, and then everything will be brought back. Only Allah will remain. Only Allah will remain. Everything will die. So in that case, it seems like the soul should die as well. Is there such a thing as a soulmate? Uh, a soulmate? There is some idea about that. Yes, there is something about that. But again, as I said, if you can't find, if you find your soulmate, you can't. We have to look at it in a practical sense. I mean, how long are you going to go around looking for a soulmate, right? But a soulmate needs to be permissible for you to spend your your time with. So you need to be married to them, if you're talking about that. When a magician side talks with dead people, does Shaitan communicate with the soul in Barzakh? Um, shaitan, you see, magicians. Okay, this is going into a whole different realm, and I've got a lecture on that on Zamzam Academy. But about the the magic stuff, right? Uh, about the magic stuff. Generally, when these uh, magicians talk to one another, uh, sorry, they they have a jinn, jinn is shaitan. That shaitan talks to probably the deceased person shaitan that would be my assumption right so he's not talking to the dead body he's talking to their shaitan and their shaitan is giving them the understanding that's my assumption okay that's my assumption that's how they can sometimes say so and so and get some information about that otherwise otherwise magicians uh, don't have that kind of power to just go and talk to dead bodies they use these jinn facilities who can and then there's a, there's a lot of conjecture in that as well. You have to remember, you can never believe a magician, okay? They may have a few truths mixed up with a lot because the source they use, which are jinn, jinn have a, a really, really wild imagination, okay? So they may have a bit of truth that they've learned from somewhere and they add a lot of other stuff to it. So you can never be 100% sure, so don't get too excited about those kind of things. And anybody who goes to a magician, to, to to have some clairvoyant uh, conversations with their deceased, then their iman is in serious jeopardy. That, that you just don't want to use that medium. It's not a medium to use. Okay, it is not a medium. It's prohibited to do that. It is unlawful. I read Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wasn't with Prophet Nuh in the ark or with other prophets. Rasulullah came when it was. Yeah, absolutely. That is right. You are right to Muhammadullah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam only came in this world. He did not exist before. You are absolutely right. There was no physical body of the Prophet sallallahu until he was born. That is absolutely right. What we're talking about is his seed, is his seed, right? Uh, just like our seeds, your seed, my seed was in our mothers, uh, in our mother from our father, right? Except that the only reason we single out the Prophet sallallahu in this discussion is just that he was, his seed was very clear who that seed is, right? Um, so the Prophet Sallallahu did not exist. That is absolutely right. And if I insinuated uh, in any other way, then that, that was incorrect. Okay. Can you explain in depth how people see Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in their dreams? Uh, not how, but does that work from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And does Prophet know who we are and if we send salam on him? You know, today that's so easy to understand. You know, year, decades ago, century ago, that would be quite complicated to even conceive. But today it's easy. How many people have we got on here? 112 live attendees. I've got 112 people. If you've got your screen on, right? I think whatever, 360, 114, whatever the number is, right? You guys can see me. Where am I? I am sitting in London. I'm not in your house, but you are looking at me on your phone. You are looking at me on your devices. How is that possible? Yeah, this is my office. It's my, um, pray that good things come out of here. Exactly. Now, we're seeing this through technology, and there's a lot more to come. Eventually, they've already got the technology. You will not have to look at me on a screen anymore. 
you know, maybe next year or three years down the road, I can be sitting with you, okay? I can be sitting with you in Texas on the other side of the table, and I can be giving you a talk even though I'm sitting here. That's hologram technology, you know, with the right kind of cameras and everything, projectors rather, right? Uh, with the right kind of shadow creating mechanisms. I will be sitting with you in Virginia in a few years if you want me to be sitting there. I won't be able to eat with you yet, I don't think so, but I'll be able to speak to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all of this technology from before. So now it's not that the Prophet has to physically come and be with a, a thousand people who are seeing the Prophet in their dream. That's another world he's in. He's in another realm. How you see him. So ulama have discussed that maybe there's like a whole channel that's opened up between each individual who is seeing the Prophet in their dream and the Prophet Right, so they all can see him. Um, but I don't see that you need to worry about this because, as I said, you can see me today. And I'm not even the Prophet Allah has a much bigger technology. And he's shown us in this century, he's actually shown us how these things are within the realm of possibility, subhanAllah. So hopefully that gives you some understanding of the question. Yes, um, the fact that it's not like we're just getting to gaze at the Prophet and he doesn't know who we are. Now, how does that part work? I don't know. The Prophet ﷺ knows and will be speaking to you. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, our actions are presented to the Prophet ﷺ on certain days and so on. He gets happy, he gets upset, whatever. That is something that Allah is giving him. How that works, I don't know. Because he's not in this world anymore. So whatever's happening, that's another world. It's another dimension. There are different rules to that dimension. So yes, when you see the Prophet ﷺ in your dream and he speaks to you, then that is not a joke. He is speaking to you. Does your mind have any connection with your soul, nafs and ruh? Of course it does. As I said, the, the ruh is just what keeps your body ticking and makes you alive. So I don't think that makes a difference. The nafs, our mind and nafs work in tandem. Our nafs is what, if it's good, it's going to give us good words. It's going to give us uh, good uh, promptings. Otherwise, it's going to give us bad promptings. And then our mind is going to follow and do something. Okay, so that's how the soul and nafs work very much in tandem. The ruh, as I said, is generally the life-giving mechanism within us. Although the ruh, they say, plays the part of the good angel as well in many cases. So the good, the ruh is where we get our good prompting. If the soul comes in tandem with that, then it becomes a good soul. There is that as well. Uh, what do we know about soul power? I don't know too much about that. Maybe you'll have to explain that to me. I don't know too much about that. I'm sorry. Um, does our soul have a shape? I don't know. It's somehow, it's something that makes us tick. It's like, you know, when you put a bat battery into a device and the device starts working, right? It's like, how is the battery in one place? The battery is like in the battery compartment, but the whole device has now started working and the light has come on, right? But the battery's in the other place. So what exactly does the soul look like? I don't think it's like a battery. As I said, it's like, the, it's a subtle body that cannot be, I think, identified that infuses with us and makes us alive. So I don't think you can say it's got a shape as such. But in the atomic world, in terms of the physical world, it will have a shape. But I don't think it's a perceptible shape. I think if you look at it from a physics perspective, I think it will have a shape. Uh, but I don't know if we can determine that shape. It's like saying, what is the shape of an atom or a quark? Right? For those of you who do physics, what is the shape of that? These are concepts and ideas right, that we know exist at some level, but it's very difficult to determine those. Things. So I think that is what we would probably say. Uh, what is this one? Heart is a part of our body and guidance resides in our hearts. So when our soul is connected to our bodies in this world, the soul becomes part of the guidance which we receive in our hearts. Is this correct? No, I don't think so. I think if you're talking about the soul as the life-giving aspect, then that's just what it is. But as I said, if you take the soul as something which Allah uses to inspire us with good aspects as opposed to evil inciting soul, then in that case, it's going to have a connection. Do, do we as souls choose the particular test trials that we experience as human beings? No. As I said, the soul is just what makes us tick. 
we, our mind, our heart, the status of our heart. The Prophet ﷺ said, it's your heart which governs your body, both physically, but he meant obviously spiritually. He said that if you, if that flesh in your body is good, then your whole body will be good. And if it's corrupt, then your whole body will be corrupt. That is cardiologically, physiologically speaking is correct, but he was talking about spiritually. So the test and trials and what we go through in life and how we look at things and all that, it's all based on our, that's more based on our heart and our minds. Uh, does our soul age with our body? I guess it does, but I don't know what difference it makes. I don't think it's older. Our soul stays as powerful as it was the day we were born to the day before we die, meaning to the minute before we die. It's as powerful, right? Um, if our body becomes weak and we frail, that's different. The soul is still there. That's my understanding. Yes, then when it dies, it goes out. I don't think the soul becomes weaker or changes at all. The soul does not change. It's either in us or outside us. So if we say age in the sense that it's been with us, it's been in the world for this many years, then yes. But if you're talking about age in the sense of becoming older and weary and uh, uh, weaker, no, I don't think so. Good questions, mashallah. Very good questions. Is death due to COVID-19 considered shaheed? It depends. It depends. If a person got, got COVID and they're like shrieking and complaining and all the rest of it, then they're definitely not a shaheed. But if they got it and they're doing sabr and patience, then they are a type of shaheed, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, because of the ailment through which they die, generally they could be included in a shaheed as long as they, they, they're they satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, do your souls choose the particular test trial that we've said? Okay, I think I've done that one. Uh, okay, we've got 13 more questions left. So, so if someone gets an abortion before the soul is connected, does the soul go to another baby? Um, no, that probably means that there was no soul for that baby. Allah knows, remember, Allah knows. So uh, it probably was that that there was no, that there was no soul. They knew that that was going to, before 120 days or 100 days or whatever, there was going to be nothing for that. There was no carrier for that. So there is no soul for that. No soul is wasted. What do souls do in Alamul Arwa? I don't know. I don't know. I think I've answered that question earlier. I don't know uh, if they even do anything or they're just, just a place to stay. Can the time? I don't think there's any tea or a canteen there. I mean, I know that for a fact, I think. right? Can anybody remember being in that Alam, by the way? There are some people who have claimed to have experienced that covenant with Allah. Do you know that? I think it was Ali radiallahu who reckons remembering that covenant with Allah. Do any of you remember being in Alam al Arwa? Uh, Tami Fatima, what about you? Sabrine, Saeed, Maryam, Diwan, Hassan? No. Okay. I mean, I guess if you could, then, you know, you could have given us that experience, you know? All right. Okay. That's enough. Um, th there's somebody who's saying little, little, but you're anonymous. So what's the point, right? Um, if I did, will not say in public, why not? I mean, it's not haram or something. It's not a bad place to be. You know, it's not like you went to the pub or the bar or something. Okay. Um, or you'd be shy to say it. Okay. All right. Let's stop. I mean, that was just a bit of a, that was just to kind of give us a bit of a break. Okay. That's just to give us a bit of a break. I, I hope you guys can take a joke. I hope you guys have a bit of humor, man. Right. Or should we, should we never be speaking about this kind of stuff? But it's true. It's a, there's a reality. There are people who uh, have that experience. Okay, so there are people who have that experience. Okay, what is the difference between the nafs and waswas of shaitan? Okay, so the shaitan he gives waswasa and whispers to the nafs. All right, not the, the the soul is what keeps us alive. So that's got nothing to do. This is the nafs that I talk about that can be good or bad and has about minimum three stages and more. So the shaitan is what tries to overcome the nafs. Our ruh tries to give the nafs good ideas. So it's whatever dominates. If we have a good thought, a good prompting, and we work on it, we act upon it. Hey, you should give that much sadaqah. Hey, you should not look at that. And we act upon it, then it will strengthen our soul to become a, on the good side. However, if we keep falling prey to it and we keep doing the wrong, okay, then the wrong aspect faculty of it becomes stronger. And then the good side of it becomes weaker. Then it just takes more effort to make it good. So the shaitan then has control in a sense. The shaitan just give a little whisper, a little prompting, and then the, the, the soul will just 
we'll just go with it. I've got lots of these uh, uh, lectures related to this topic, all right, on uh, Zamzam Academy. So, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you can you can listen to them at your leisure afterwards, inshallah. There's a lot of the spiritual discussions on there. Uh, can the time and place of death change by dua? Allah knows best. Allah will know the exact time that you're going to die. Allah knows. But it could change in the perspective that we generally perceive that this guy should have died on that day because the bullet went right through here. But he didn't. It, nothing will change what is in the so it may be written because there are two types of destiny and there's another lecture I would if somebody can find it so I'm going to defer this and that discusses all of this it's called don't be depressed you don't know your future it's a one hour 15 minute lecture on everything to do with decree and inshallah lots of people have found it very satisfying and I went please go ahead and listen to it it'll put inshallah a lot of aspects of your life in perspective so if somebody can find that and put it up uh, for the benefit, don't start looking at these things now. You can go and view the lecture later. But it's called Don't Be Depressed. You Don't Know Your uh, Future. So inshallah, that will be very useful there. Okay, Diwan is fast, ma fast mashallah. And Zainab's already done it. Been there, done that. Alhamdulillah. There is so many people from uh, time of Adam, Islam. how will we know who will be judged first? Why, why do you have to care? Why, why would you care about that? To be honest, on that day, I don't think people are going to care. It's just like, I'd rather get reckoned first. Because remember, on that day, Allah will not even start the reckoning and it'll be such heat and agony that then finally a few people will get together and say, let's get the prophets to ask Allah to start the reckoning. So at least we know where we're going. So I don't think you need to worry about that because all we need to worry about is how good we are. If we're good, inshallah, then we will be in the lounge on the day of judgment under the shade of the throne of Allah. The lounge. You know, when you, if you've ever flown business class, first class, you lounge, everything goes just so easy. If you're a good person, you're going to be in the shade of Allah. That's all you need to be worried about. Then it's just relaxed. You're in the rahmah of Allah, right? So let's uh, worry about that, inshallah. Allah send us, Allah let us be in the shade in the lounge inshallah based on the fact someone was suppressed all their life uh, this wouldn't have an impact on soul no this the, because you're still alive you're still kicking that's the soul right you're still in this world you're talking about other stuff is there such a thing that one soul split into soul and put onto two different bodies not that i've heard of not that i've heard of maybe in the hereafter if i get a chance to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'll ask him if that was possible I mean it's obviously possible for him but why would he do that for right and why does it matter whether we've got half a soul or not we're still as long as we're alive that's what matters mashallah people have some really uh, wild imaginations uh, can you do charity for someone who passed that was learning about Islam but hadn't taken shahada Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar we hope that they privately believed but w but if they haven't openly taken shahada we can't do anything. We can't pray for them anymore, right? As Allah says in the Quran, you know, it's not going to benefit. But if they they were privately had already believed, even though they did not openly believe, then that's up to Allah. Then why do we care? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows their reality anyway. Okay. Uh, is it bad to wish someone death because they're indulging in so much suffering? No. Why would you do that for? Why wouldn't you just say, "May Allah make you better, give you respite, give you relief"? You know what I say when. Generally, somebody tells me that there's somebody who's very, very old and they're like on the machine now and they're suffering. I say, look, may Allah grant them rest. That's what I say. That could be if Allah wills rest in this world as in relief or if death is better for them because it's written, then that rest is better because they're going, inshallah, to a better place. And hopefully they've earned something out of this difficulty if they've dealt with it right. So I think make kind of a more neutral dua. Ask Allah for relief or rest or something like that. Then say, may Allah kill him or may Allah let him die or cause him to die. You, however, it is allowed that if there's a bad person that you can, uh, uh, we, we know from certain hadith and so on, that you can uh, wish for death for such people or for them to be gone. I also have a question about something I experienced. What is the meaning of feeling your heart chest area open and something coming out, leaving from the chest and then something going into the chest and closing and then faint? I couldn't forget. I want to know what it is. Um... 
I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure whether that was done in a wakeful state or in uh, a dream. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know everything, unfortunately. So my apologies. I don't know that one. But where was Jesus all carried from Jerusalem? Does this all evolve from the day of inception until the death of a person or it remains just static force? I don't know. I think it just stays static. It's just giving you life. The, the soul that makes your body tick, the root, that's what I'm talking about. I think it just stays, right? And I think we can, we can improve it. I guess, look, a good person's soul will be better than a bad person's soul. A good person's soul, because the soul is, a, you know, the soul, the root, what makes us tick, is, belongs to Allah. So it would like to be in a good person. If it's in a bad person, like, man, what kind of a soul is this? So I, there may be something like that. Maybe some, something like that. So I would say, as long as we do good, our soul will be good, right? Maybe I can judge that. Our last question, is there a way we can judge ourselves if we are good or bad souls? Of course. Are we more inclined to good or bad? That's the best way. In fact, um, you're not letting me get to that, but... Um, it says that Imam Ghazali has said, Rahimahullah, that when you get to the age of 40 and if your good has not overcome your bad, like generally you do more good than bad, right? You're, you're not missing prayers as much. You're not messing around. You're not involved in big harams. Then it's good. But if your good does not overcome the bad, then after 40, it becomes more difficult because you become more fixed in your ways. So you really need to get worried. And then the next phase it talks about is at the age of 60 says that 60 is after which you don't get much excuse. Allah says in the Quran, أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرُ وَجَاءَكُمُ النَّذِيرُ Haven't we given them an age, a life, in which anybody who could have reflected, had enough time to reflect, could have reflected. And also the warner came to you. Okay, the warner came to you, meaning many warnings, weakness of body, illnesses, white hair, um, other people dying of your age or similar age. All of that is a warning. You've had enough experience with that warning. Okay. You've had enough experience with that warning and you still haven't got it. You're at the age of 60. So that's why it generally says that anybody who reaches the age of 60 after that, they have less, less excuse. At 40, you need to start getting really worried. Okay. But at the age of 60, then if you're not worried, then you're in a really, really bad place. Yeah, I'm going to carry on with the lecture. I'm not taking any more questions. I think we've you've done all your questions for the day. I think I think you're done, man. Right. So let us start with the with with the world. As I was saying, this begins uh, from when we're delivered from the womb. Uh, that that's when this world begins. As Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Walakad khalaqna al-insana min sulalat min tin, thumma jalnahu nutfatan fi qarari makin, thumma khalaqna nufat alaqa." So everything I've said about the five different stages, everything is from the Quran. So this is the first stage where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we created the insan from a product of clay. Then after that, we made him a drop of fluid in a safe lodging. Fi qarari makin. Thumma khalaqna nutfata alaqa. Then we took that fluid, that drop, and then we made that into a clot. And then it, it carries on and discusses the, all the embryonic stages. And then it talks about coming into this world. And then Allah says, Surat, this is from Surah Al-Mu'minun. Allah says, Allahu ahsanu al So Allah be blessed, the most beautiful and wonderful and excellent of creators. Okay. Allah, there's numerous verses. Okay. I'm not going to go through all of these verses. But uh, I've also told you about... The hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, which is probably the most comprehensive hadith about the whole uh, development of the human being from embryonic stages into this world and when the ruh is blown in and all that from Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu. Okay. Then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thumma yukhrijukum tifla. Then Allah extracts you into this world or causes you to emerge in this world as a child. Thumma litablughu ashuddakum. Thereafter that, you reach your your age or your uh, um, uh, level of uh, stability and strength, which is your youth. Eventually, some of you are those who die straight away. Okay. Um, and there's some of you who uh, are returned to evil old age. So Allah says in the Quran that some of you are going to die earlier in your youth, in your infancy, in your middle age. 
But then there's some of you who are also going to be returned to the evil old age. إِلَىٰ أَرْضَ لِلْعُمُرْ لِكَيْ لَا يَعْلَمَ مِنْ بَعْدِ عِلْمٍ شَيْئًا So that after having knowledge, after having awareness, you would not have any awareness anymore. You know, when a person gets Alzheimer's or um, dementia or something like that, right? That's in Surah Al-Hajj. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ghafir, some of you become old, right? But some of you do are taken and their lives end before that. The main thing is that you are all going to reach that particular age that has been designated for you. And so that you can understand this. The second life then, as I said, is when a person moves from the state of childhood to puberty, youth, young adulthood and, and and so on now you know when the human being is is born uh, you must have heard the hadith or you must have actually observed this that what happens when a child is born what's the first thing that generally happens to that child when they're born they cry they make them cry they say that the reason they cry is because the shaitan pricks them prods them okay the prodding of the shaitan the poke as you do on facebook these days right now, the reason is that uh, they're poking you so that shaitan is saying, I'm going to have an influence on you. The only people that were got saved from that, especially, uniquely, was Jesus, peace be upon him, and his mother. All right. So um, that's what generally happens. That's why, what is the first thing that we do to a newborn in the Muslim tradition? Adhan. Adhan in the right ear, iqama in the left ear. That should be the first thing. Now, let me give you some uh, tips on this, right? I don't know how many of you are married, how many have had children, and so on, okay? The first thing that Allah wants any child to hear is His name. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Okay? And the last thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to go with is La ilaha illallah, with His name. So from the beginning to the end. Now, when we're just born, we don't have that ability to say it with ourselves. So our parents or somebody says it. Now, if you are alone as a mother and you got nobody, don't wait for a man to come along or the sheikh to come along or the husband. You just say it yourself. Then you can have somebody else say it as well if you want to. Otherwise, just say it. Um, now, think about this. Right? A child is born. Um, how many of you have experienced a childbirth recently that they can remember. Uh, I, I mean, you don't have to tell me about it. I want you to tell me what do you think were the first words that that child heard generally in your experience from the one that you saw? Was it Allahu Akbar? Was that the first words they heard or was it something else? You know what? I was so particular about this. Yeah, Mariam's got it, right? Oh, it's a boy. Oh, it's healthy. Oh, it's out. It's all over. Right? Oh, it's a girl. Here you go. Such a beautiful girl. Right? Worse still, it may be Whitney Houston that they may hear. It may be, I, I don't know these singers, uh, Gaga, Lady Gaga. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes they've got music on in the background. This is what I did. And this is just my advice, my suggestion. I I took, when my first child was born about 23 years ago, I took a Walkman. In those days, you had cassettes and it was a Walkman. With, and I still remember Sheikh Ghamidi on there. Not the current Ghamidi, Sheikh, the other one. And uh, subhanAllah, um, I told everybody, Alhamdulillah, I think we had a separate room or something. And I explained to them that we have a certain ritual, so I don't want anybody saying anything. If I remember correctly, I definitely did that with so much. I can't remember if I did it with all of them. I said, I don't want anybody saying anything. I, the first voice will be me. So I think they were very respectful, mashallah. I gave me a child and I made the adhan. After that, when he was in the cradle on that first day, I still remember his face. My Hudayf, I still remember his face. I put she he was weeping. He was like whimpering. I put Sheikh Ghamidi on and he just quietened out. And that Sheikh Ghamidi must have been with him for the next one or two or three days. Right? Because I thought, let him hear, let him hear. My, you know, I wasn't going to be there all the time. My wife is going to be resting. 
So I can't expect her to be reading Quran. So let me put that on. You have to be creative. And I remember once when I went, there, there was one ward in and the music was playing, you know, because they just got it on or something. So you have to tell them these kind of things. I really, 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 really faithfully believe that these things have a major impact on our life. You know, in many traditions, the worst swear they can give to you, right, is that you are haram ki awlad. Those of you who understand Urdu will know. Like, in fact, in Arabic, they say you're harami. And like, what do you mean harami? My father and mother are married. Okay. The, what they say is that you, some, and some people actually say clearly, and of course, this is just a curse. It's just a swear. It's just a abuse. But they say, you are be bismillah ki awlad. Like you are an offspring of no bismillah. Which means that your parents didn't read Bismillah when they had you. So we are told to remember Allah and have a dua when even sexual intimacy is taking place. Because we're bringing a new human, a new life, a new entity into the body. And as believers, they need to be connected. We need to remind them of their natural faith. We need to maintain that natural faith that they're born on. If that's the case from there and the mother, when she's carrying the child, is told to be careful and read Quran. And there's been so many studies that have shown the effect of certain things people did while they were pregnant on their children. Subhanallah. That's why I believe in your child comes into the world. In fact, I don't, I'm not maybe that particular anymore. And my children are a bit older now, but definitely my first child. I would not go into a store with him. We would not go into a store with him if there was music on. One of us would stand outside with the pram, the push chair, with the child, and the other one go in to get what they needed to. You can call me extreme, okay? But really, really, this is what I felt very strongly about based on my studies of the Quran and Sunnah, okay? And may Allah bless my children and all of our children but i think every little bit that we do okay every little bit that we do i think it counts that's the best you know that we need to do as much as we can to make these good souls so that when they grow up and uh, go beyond us then we've given them enough to go by right so that they can lead their lives themselves we need to pray for them this is i don't want to turn this into uh, a tarbiyatul awlad session but it's a very because we are dealing with souls they are souls as well at the end of the day so anyway let me just finish off uh, we talked about the shaitan pricking and so on and then I also told you that uh, the hadith says that every child is born on that natural faith having had that experience of that covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it's the parents that are going to mess them up or whatever now imagine You've got a mother and father. I mean, the mother, I don't, I'm not incriminating the mother here, but th there's a reason why the mother has three times more rights, you know, for the children than the father does. They just have dealt with, you know, they've dealt with nine months in the womb, subhanAllah, right? As I said, we really need to respect our women for that reason alone, right? Then they've uh, breastfed them for I don't know how many months. But you see, uh, that being an honor, is also a big liability. Imagine you've you've got a mother who's breastfeeding the child, but she's watching something weird, passing her time, right? Watching all of this haram that's going on, watching uh, illicit relationships. You know, as bad in a normal sense, but when you're feeding your child, we know enough stories of the past of the nurture of a soul, is that when mothers they play a big part we, we we this modern world makes a woman a career woman they're bringing up the next generation that next generation depends on these women i'm nothing today without my mother allah bless her allah bless her allah bless her you know even my father had all the support in the back but i think the big part was my mother and allah bless her She's departed this world, but I think everything that I do is Sadaqa Jariya. If you want, may Allah allow me and everybody else to continue doing good so that we can be Sadaqa Jariya for our mother. Right? So they've got a responsibility, subhanAllah. Got a responsibility. Um, anyway, uh, now when the child grows up, we're told, uh, we're encouraged by the age of seven now to start training them for prayer. You don't force them, you encourage them. You tell them nicely. 
And generally, if you're doing it, the children will just follow. They'll have their, they'll ask for a prayer mat and they'll want to do it anyway. All right. You set the scene in your house, your children will naturally follow. Okay. Uh, and then what will happen is uh, at the age of 10, you're supposed to discipline them in that regard. They, they while it's still not fard on them, you need to, they can't start doing it when they become 13, 15, like straight away the next day. So now you start disciplining them. Also, what you need to do at the age of 10 is you need to separate between boys and girls. You can't be allowed to sleep in the same bed. Likewise, a mother is no longer allowed to sleep with her son who's 10 years old. Or a father is not allowed to sleep with her their daughter who is 10 years old now. In fact, by the age of 7, you should move them away. That's why if your child is still sleeping between you, right, you need to drink the bitter pill and go and get rid of them, right, into another room or into a cot or something like that. That's what I mean by that. Um, there was there was a uh, a couple who had this issue and I told the husband that, you know what, uh, because they just couldn't let the kid go away. So I told the husband, you go and sleep in a room. He's a good friend of mine. I said, you go and sleep in another room for, I don't know, a few days. And he managed to do that. The wife managed to, mashallah, separate uh, and, uh, you know, wean the children from their bed. It's not, it's not healthy anymore. Uh, and now in this modern world with the corruption, it's even worse. Okay. Now, as I said, children are not uh, obligated to pray, but they need to be encouraged uh, to pray. Uh, and remember, every good deed that a child does at the encouragement of their parents, the parents will be rewarded for it. Okay. Can you make them pray Salat in the age of five? Yes, you can. Um, but you need to do it not with not with any harshness or any, uh, you know, you need to let them be. You need to encourage them, basically. Uh, Alhamdulillah, one of my kids, he did, uh, he kept a fast at the age of five. It was a bit by accident. We didn't really want him to do it. But it was just like he put, he, he went to sleep halfway through because then it was like half a fast. But then he went to sleep. And then when he woke up, there was only two hours left and he managed to pull it through. That was quite amazing. The other one, he kept at uh, six so I think the youngest is at five. And these were the longest fasts in England. These were the fasts that we only had three hours to eat in. So that would have been 21 hours, right? I think it was that. No, no, no. It was a bit before that. So they were maybe about 18 hours. Uh, we, will never, we never force our children to fast, but they like insist on fasting, right? Anyway, uh, which is, means that um, anybody who directs towards good is like the doer of the good. So that's why you will be reward. So there's reward in you encouraging your children to do good, but you can't use any kind of physical force or anything like that uh, at the age of seven at all. Okay. Anyway, when they become, uh, when they reach puberty, that's when the angels uh, start to write, right? They're given commands and everything. Uh, um, so, uh, that's in Surah Al-Infitar. Then you've got another verse. Uh, Every word that they speak, there's somebody waiting there prepared to write it. So this is the angels now. Now the world begins for the child at the age of maturity, 13, 14, 9, 10, you know, whatever age they become mature. Now, you as parents we should have got them ready for this right uh because everything is going to be recorded that's why you should tell your children that look you're really in a good position you've not missed any prayers you don't want to miss any prayers. you don't want to waste your youth like that you know because a lot of people they've got five years of missed prayer ten years of missed prayer three years of missed prayer tell your children look you've got a chance to start with a clean slate because now uh, after maturity everything is being recorded all right uh, can this all be inherently evil or good when allah creates it um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates everybody with a chance I don't think there's anybody inherently evil But there's some people who are Allah knows that they're going to do evil So they eventually end up doing evil with their free will So I think if you listen to that lecture Don't be depressed, you don't know your future That will answer that question a bit more But there is no inherently evil soul within human beings Shaitan was a different idea uh, I'm scared of purification of soul and fire Are our major sins forgiven? When we do tawbah, people, yes, our major sins are forgiven, right? Our major sins are forgiven when we do tawbah before we die. May Allah accept our tawbah, allow us to do the tawbah. And um, how can we get in touch with you? You can get in touch uh, through uh, zamzamacademy.com.
and that starts our second existence which is the existence of this world now this existence of this world if you remember it's split up into five sections one is from infancy childhood uh, until until your youth begins and what was that age does anybody remember what that age was when we go from the first stage to the second stage of this life of this world it was when we become mature when we become balig now there's different ways that people become balig i think i might mention this if you have children there yes puberty if you have children there that are very young um, i mean i can mention in a way i can mention in a way that's fine um, people become balig uh, mature technically speaking according to the sharia shari they become responsible beings now right it's 14 years and 7 months uh, 14 years and seven months, which is essentially 15 Islamic years. So 15 Islamic years, which go by the lunar years, they're smaller, they're shorter than the Gregorian years that we're generally used to. So according to the Gregorian years, when any child becomes 14 years and seven months, they would have definitely become considered to be accountable and ad uh, and and uh, uh, mature enough now to to be responsible for the dictates of the sharia however uh, boys and girls can actually become mature earlier and those are uh, this 14 years and seven months is actually only if no other maturity sign shows itself so maturity signs are um, a wet dream and i'm, I'm going to use these terms i mean I don't think children will understand them, but you know, adults will understand them. It's a wet, uh, ejaculation is, is for a man. It's an ejaculation in any way, whether that be through a a a, a, a wet dream or or through now the will, you know, um, doing it by oneself or uh, number three by impregnation. So if uh, they they were to be married at a young age, you know, had they been, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, we're encouraging any of that right now, but in the past, people have been married at an age, and if they impregnate a woman, right, and even today, subhanAllah, there are, unfortunately, um, this kind of stuff that goes on, if they impregnate someone, then that in itself is also shown as a sign of maturity, which basically means that an ejaculation took place. And, uh, and then if none of that happens, then of course, by the age of 14 years and seven months, then by age, they would have become mature. With a girl, it's, um, it's either... Uh, having the onset of menstruation, even if that's at you know as young as the age of ten or eleven or twelve, for example, right? And the other one is being impregnated. Another one is uh, what do you call it to have a um, uh, an orgasm, right? Um, th these are these are uh, all things that would make a girl mature as well. But again, at the age of fourteen and seven months, we are now mature. So now this begins the second phase of this second existence of ours in this world. So that's the second phase. Thereafter that, the second, um, the, the, this is the life of youth now that begins from the age of maturity, whenever that is, whether that's 14 years and seven months or slightly earlier. And that, as I mentioned, goes until the age of 35, according to Ibn al -Jawzi. You're still a youth until the age of 35, 35, right? Now this, you can call it youth, you can call it young ad adulthood, uh, maturity, and, and and so on whatever you want to call it right now just one thing is that until you become 14 and seven months or you get any of the signs before that until maturity we're not responsible for any of the acts that we do so uh if we did die according to the majority opinion uh, any muslim any muslim child who dies goes to paradise that's the strongest opinion because the prophet sallallahu said rufi al qalamu an thalathatin uh, the, the, the pen has been lifted off three categories of people, which means that there's no accountability, there's no reckoning, there's no hisab, um, accountability that's going on. From a child until they become mature. Right? From a sleeping person until they wake up. So anybody does something crazy in their sleep, they're not responsible. I don't know what the law says, but in Islam, they would not be responsible. So for example, if a person divorces his wife in sleep while while sleeping or uh, 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 what you call it in a dream or something like that that is not considered a valid action likewise so anybody who's overcome by insanity they've gone crazy they've lost their mind like genuinely lost their mind then that person is also not responsible anymore right if they do something they're not responsible i mean you can take measures uh, to make sure that they don't harm anybody but they're not 
technically responsible as such. They don't, there's no reward and punishment for them in terms of the hereafter for that. Of course, uh, anybody who did good deeds, they had regular good deeds. And then if this happened to them, they lost their mind through dementia or anything like that, even later in life. Inshallah, it's hoped that they would actually get the deed uh, reward of the deeds that they used to do regularly. So if they used to go Hajj every year and now they can't, then they, they should probably get the reward of a Hajj every year. If they prayed Salat in the Masjid or they, they did some good deeds like uh, relief work or donations or whatever, now they can't, they should still continue to get the, the reward for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that. So then for children, why do we make them do good deeds? And why can we, well, I mean, the, the scholars have written that, for example, you cannot feed your children haram food because we're still trying to grow this soul in them. I mean, uh, the parents will be responsible. The children may not be sinful if they ate something haram by mistake or whatever. But if the parents have not nurtured them and have not, the, the parents are responsible. So if children actually do do good deeds based on what the parents have you know, encourage them or they've seen the parents, the parents will be rewarded. And they're rewarded because of a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, The one who indicates towards good is like the doer of the good. So you get that reward. You know, there's a lot of incentives in the Sharia like this. You do something, you show them the way, you get the same reward, right? So I show them the way to pray. I show them the way to, you know, um, help somebody, to give thanks to somebody. I get that reward as well. That's a lot of incentive in there. Uh, so, you know, when we're, when we're doing tarbiyah of our children and nurturing them and bringing them up and uh, and helping them and training them and teaching them, we're actually getting reward for that. It's our responsibility anyway, but we're actually getting reward, and that's the beauty of the deen. Okay. Now, when they become uh, when they become uh, fourteen years and seven months, and they become uh, adolescent or mature, and they reach puberty, then now they become responsible for every single command. Now you have to remember in Islam, there's no like after that, there's a you know difference between younger than 18 and after 18. In Islam, you become adult, so-called adult for uh, from, uh, what do you call it? From uh, the age of maturity, okay? From the age of maturity. So the, the, the person who's six, 15 years old and the one who's 20 and the one who's 70, they are all responsible equally in uh, their, their, their responsible equally for for prayer and for all the other good deeds and abandoning haram and so on and so forth. It does. There's no difference in that. Yes, if somebody's sick, if somebody's senile or whatever, there may be some rules that change in terms of that. But that could be an age, a person of 15 years old. If he's sick, he would have the same concessions. But otherwise, there's no no difference. All the commands, they're now commands, prohibitions, all of that. Now, what happens exactly is that we have the soul, but there are two angels. Again, we can't see these angels. They're ordered now. I mean, we probably had these angels designated to us, you know, from from before, from when we were born. There's two angels uh, designated for us. Likewise, there's a shaitan which who's designated for us. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim which says that whenever a child is born, right, there's a shaitan, a kareem that is designated for them, right, and that shaitan is is one shaitan to every human being. It's not like one shaitan who has got 10 human beings or one whole family and he has to run around like, okay, trying to mess this guy up and mess this person up and deviate that person. No, it's actually one shaitan per person. That shaitan has been with us all of our life. Our shaitan knows more about us than probably a lot of other people. Okay, and he knows exactly what makes us tick. That's what makes it difficult. Shaitan doesn't have to force us to commit a sin. He just has to encourage us. He knows that if a certain person goes on a certain website, you know, he knows that it generates. So then he just has to create some ideas, create a reminder of the pleasure that they got from going onto that website, talking to somebody, right, where who he may be haram to speak to, stealing something, you know. So all of this now becomes activated. The two angels that had been probably lying dormant until now, maybe writing for the parents, uh, rewards for the parents, etc. Now they become activated and now they are going to write everything that we do. Everything is going to be recorded. Now they can't, you know, they, 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 there's lots of dis dif discussion about whether they can read our minds or not, or whether we, uh, one of the opinions is that we actually em em emanate a certain smell or fragrance depending on the good and bad that we're thinking about it's quite sophisticated actually the system that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has of these angels who are writing it, it, it's quite sophisticated right i don't think the modern technology the modern technology is not up there yet so anyway allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in the quran surah al-infitar 
لحافظين كرام كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون right the upon you are the protective ones the protectors the kiram and katibin now tell me which one is called kiram and which one is called katibin anila which one is kiram and which is katibin and sabrina i mean you were there last time as well if i remember right um any of you can respond actually uh, which one is kiram and which one is katibin okay mashallah we got one response so karam uh, or kiram and i guess is you're saying is that the right one and the other one is the left one well at least you had the mashallah at least no we didn't cover it it's something that um your teacher should have taught you already kiram and right katibin left okay mashallah we're getting some some interesting ideas here okay well let me let me just make it i uh, shall i shall i offer shall i offer like um um 10 pounds or something or 10 dollars or 20 dollars or something um, okay, it's none of them. They're both kiram and katibin. The word kiram is a plural of kareem, and katibin, yes, katibin means writers. So kiram and katibin is just plural words that mean noble writers. They're noble writers. They're both noble writers. Okay, they are both noble writers. Uh, essentially, what happens sometimes is that I don't know. They they teach this to children, or somehow people have this idea. That this is Kiraman and this one is Katibin, but that's not the truth. They're just noble scribes, they're just noble writers, right? It's Raqib. Raqib again, Raqib means those who are lying in wait, right? That's really what they mean. This is you can say an adjectival name, it's just the descriptive name. Okay, they're the noble writers on the shoulders. Yes, that's right. Mashallah, at least we've got that clarified. So now we won't be teaching our children the wrong thing, inshallah. And they know exactly what you do. Then um, th there's a. These are noble writers, and then Allah says, "إذ يتلقى المتلقيان عن اليمين وعن الشمال قعيد ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد." Subhanallah. Uh, this is uh, amazing. Subhanallah. Um, not a word that you say except that there is somebody waiting in prepar prepared and waiting to basically note that down. So this is about these angels. It's mentioned. Um, the, the, this is mentioned in the hadith I say, right? Allahu Akbar. Waja, uh, uh, on the day of judgment, then in Surah Qaf, he mentions, وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِقُ وَشَهِيدٌ Every nafs on that day will arrive, and with them will be uh, the, the, the one that's driving them, and a witness. So that's going to happen in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate that for us. It's now, now it becomes a responsibility for the parents to refresh and remind the children about their new responsibility. What they've been training them to do all of this time, now it becomes a responsibility for the parents to remind them that, look, now you're more good. This is what I tell my children. You know, when they become mature, I say, look, you're very lucky that you now have been, you know, doing the best you can for your salat. So now that you've become mature, you are now accountable. Don't be like other people that you slackened off in the beginning, right? And you didn't take it seriously. And then when you become uh, you become older, 20, and then you realize that, you know what? I've got five years of prayer to make up, or I've got four years or three years, I messed up my fajrs or whatever. I said, you've got a fresh start. SubhanAllah, I was speaking to some converts just uh, about a month or two ago. And I said, how many prayers do you ha have you got missed? They said, not a single one. I said, you are so lucky. You are so lucky that you don't have a single prayer that you miss because mashallah, they were serious from the beginning, right? And for us, right, who are born Muslim, for many of us who are born Muslim, you know, unfortunately, it, it's not that rosy for everybody. I mean, we've had the opportunity and the advantage of being Muslim. That's why, you know, if there's one message that you take away from here is that the first thing to be reckoned with on the day of judgment is going to be our salat. It's the first thing that's going to be reckoned with. It's also one of the last things that, the, one of the final things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually mentioned before he passed away. He said, As salat, as salat, wa ma malakat aymanukum. Prayer, prayer, like be careful of your prayer, be observant of your prayer, guard your prayer, and those which your right hand possess. Meaning those who work for you, those who may, you know, at that time they were slaves, uh, that, that was... Um, that that was what uh, people uh, that that was what the discussion was, all right at that time. So salat is the last thing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us of. He died basically reminding us of that, and it's the first thing to be reckoned with. That's why what I would suggest is that everybody uh, make a calculation. Doesn't matter how many years it is or what it comes up to. 
make an estimate, a calculation of how many prayers you've missed, okay, and then start doing them up. Believe me, um, there's people who I know with 10 years of prayer and mashallah, they've got it done. So it's not it's not that difficult. I know it's going to sound a very daunting task, but really, really, it's something that we need to try to clear up. And uh, if we die trying and we don't finish it, at least we can say we died trying. So anyway, parents remind remind them, especially, um, subhanAllah. Now, if there's anything else you need to teach them, we can teach them whether it's a wajib or a fard or a sunnah mu'akkada or whatever the case is. Now, you have to remember that youth, the, the age of youth is the age in which humans at that age discover their potentials. They discover energies. They discover that they can make their own mind about certain things. They start rebelling sometimes. If there's not very good training with the parents and if there's not a good communication they start rebelling this is the a very very difficult uh, age and psychologically speaking it says that uh, parts of the brain right parts of the brain are developing and other parts have not yet fully developed because it's by the age of 28 29 or even later that the brain fully develops in every aspect because they say that young people uh, 18, 19, the risk taking, uh, the, 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 the risk taking part of the brain has not yet developed. For example, that's why you find that young people, the teens, all right, they're more willing to take risks. They don't understand responsibility yet fully. Okay. That's why this is a very critical moment. The youth is this time, you know, between the ages of 15, 16 and on to about 25, 30. If you don't make your life here, if you don't build, uh, you know, set down the uh, building blocks uh, for you, the rest of your life, the foundations of your life, you know, you could be suffering for a very long time afterwards. Okay. You could be suffering for a very long time afterwards. This is the time that you can either make it or really waste a, a lot of time and break it afterwards. Okay. So that's why the youth has also been described as a youth is craziness and the reason i think it says it's craziness or insanity is because youth are willing to do all sorts of things if they're just misled or if they're just encouraged to do some weird things right that's why there's a arab poet who says Ida fata aman wa fakharu fala fakhar, fala fakhara. that if a, a, a youth reaches the age of 20 and He's not been able to find something that he can take pride in. He and she can take pride in. Then it's difficult to take find something to take pride in afterwards. Uh, another poet says, "Ida lam tasud fi layali shababi, fala fala sutta ma ishta min baadi hinna, wa hal jullu wa hal jullu umrika illa shababu, khud al hadha minhu wa la tamhil wa la tumhilanna." Basically saying that in the nights of your in the nights of your youth, in the nights of your youth, if you don't acquire the, if you do not acquire the, you can say the seeds or the tools of, uh, of leadership, then you will never become a leader later. I mean, obviously it's a bit of an, uh, you know, exaggeration kind of idea, right? Because isn't the major, isn't the main part of your life your youth now remember the youth we're talking about is from the age of 14 or 15 to the 35 that's a big age right that's a long age 32 34 35 that is according to ibn al Jawzi. that's youth in islam right so if in that age if you do not gain your leadership qualities you will never right you will never uh, would you call it um become a leader Right, because isn't the main significant portion of your life your youth? So make sure that you take a good part of it. Make sure that you take your good share of it, and do not delay this and do not mess this up. So, so um, there you go. I mean, if we hopefully we we did uh, benefit from it. If we didn't, then inshallah we will make sure that our children benefit and we they won't repeat repeat the same mistakes. Now, what happens is that let's just go beyond thirty five now to get into the next section. Right, the soul is with our body. It's uh, past the age of thirty-five. Now you've gone beyond your risk-taking years, your fast cars, and you know uh, everything else that you wanted to acquire. You may have settled down right now, 
and uh, you know you may be married by now you may even have some children inshallah and and all the rest of it so now what's left now it says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and there's a few verses about this especially the age of 40 is a very very important age it's actually mentioned in the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually a dua for us for the age of 40 okay and there's a lot of things that are associated with the age of 40 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qasas right when he reached his age of his his strength his full strength and he became um, uh, stabilized and uh, we gave him then the hukum and the ilm right we gave them the command and the knowledge generally most prophets aside from isa alayhi salam and i think it was yahya alayhi salam right jesus and john beside all of them they were even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was actually given prophecy at the age of 40 because the ulama mentioned and this is something you know from experience as well that that's when the person's mind fully matures it all comes together right everything is now mature and subhanallah that's a really precarious time and I'll tell you something about this now this is a time when a lot this is a time between the ages of 37 38 to about 40 41 is when people go through midlife crisis why is it called midlife crisis all right why is it called midlife crisis is because the the general age of the of a person is around 70 okay if they're lucky between 70 to 80 if they're very very lucky i mean some people die before 70 especially now in covid lots of people have died but generally the idea is that 40 is your peak now you've climbed uphill until then right you've climbed uphill you've gone into your peak you've really enjoyed your youth because you had a lot of vitality, a lot of strength, and mashallah, vigor. Now when you start going down, you, you don't get the same benefit that you had on this side. You actually start going down. Psychologically, it hits you that, hey, I'm 40 now. Because our reference point are people who, our reference point are people who die around between 60 and 70, or you know, few people that go to 80. So we're thinking, well, we're just 25 years, 30 years, that's all we got left. We've done 40 years. Now people start thinking, what did I do for 40 years? Now, what did I do for 40 years? This is what you call midlife crisis. What have I done for 40 years? If people are in messed up relationships, you, they, 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 you see that there's actually a lot of divorces that take place at that age. There's people who think that they, they've not achieved anything in this world. So then they go and they want to take risks like they want to go and start a business at this age. There's some people who may go and buy a Harley Davidson at this age to enjoy themselves. There's people at this age who think, you know, I've wasted a lot of time. I need to now travel and have holidays. You know, there's people who actually start committing adultery at this age. You know, if they don't divorce their, their, their spouses, then they start committing adultery. This is I'm saying in the mainstream. OK, now in Islam, we've got several things about this. OK about this age as a human being whether you're muslim or otherwise you're going to go through these feelings because when you get to the top you're like you know what did i get out of coming up here you know what have i got now i've got 25 years left 30 years 20 years maybe what am i going to do in that i need to achieve something now tell me is there anybody here who's around you know who's experienced that age who's getting you know who, who's be around 40 or just over and they know what i'm talking about It'll be interesting to know because I'll tell you about my situation. Any experiences? I just want to, I just want, I'd love to, sh you know, uh, see. I mean, if you want to share, that's up to you, obviously, right? If you want to share, share. Feeling of failure, starting a business. Okay. I mean, some of the stuff that I said, subhanAllah, right? Um, anxiety, depression. May Allah make it easy. May Allah make it easy. May Allah make it easy. SubhanAllah. I mean, the rest of you who are younger, Right. Lots of stuff. That's the time when you really start thinking, what did I do all this time? And, you know, the rest of, you know, I never had this experience. You know, you're starting a new business. OK, I mean, I'll give you a bottle in that. What I'm saying is that, you know, for those of you who are younger. Right. You are really in a fortunate spot. I didn't have anybody when I was 20, 25 and 30. Right. Who had this kind of discussion, you know, with 40 year olds and older and they could talk about their midlife crisis, right? And that could be a warning for me that, uh, you know, you see what it is, is that Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says that if somebody does not, his good does not overcome his bad, 
by the age of 40, then he has much more difficult task ahead of him. Then it's quite bad because you see what it is, is that we become quite fixed in our ways by the age of 40. When you're 20, even 30, you have a lot of flexibility. But by the age of 35 and 40, you've become quite fixed. You know, you've probably got a house, you've probably settled, you probably have children, you have probably have a steady job or whatever it is. You've got a steady routine and a system. If you're doing certain things, it's probably very steady. The kind of friends you've made are probably going to be, you know, if they're no good, then they're no good. So what's going on is that you become very fixed. Now to change all of that after the age of 40 becomes, you're not as flexible as you were before. That's why those of you who are less than 40, who are still in their 20s and 30s, try to orient yourself so that at the age of 40, I mean, as soon as possible, really, but by the age of 40, you can say that my good dominates my evil. Because then it will be, inshallah, smoother sailing. Remember, even at the age of 40, even if you're the most evil person, there's, you know, there's no door which is shut. You still have the option. You know, we're still, but it's just a bit more difficult. That's all it is. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in Surah Al-Ahqaf. And then it carries on. So until this is what Allah says until a person reaches their state of stage of strength and they reach the age of 40 arba'in sana the age of 40 years it's actually mentioned there right so then they call out now this is the dua that we should make this is actually the dua for the age of 40 right oh our lord grant me the enablement that i thank you for your bounties that you have showered upon me and upon my parents so at the age of 40, actually told to make dua for ourselves and our parents and give thanks to Allah for that, right? That give me that you're saying to Allah, give me the ability, the enablement to thank you for the bounties that you have showered upon me and upon my parents and that I can do good deeds, right? That I can do good deeds that you will be satisfied with. That you, I can do good deeds that you can be satisfied with. May Allah accept that dua. That's why I said most prophets, they got the office of prophecy at the age of 40, right? And essentially what it is, is that they say that it, it's very, it becomes quite clear or significantly clear that at this age, whether a person is ultimately going to be intended for good or evil, right? For there are signs at this point, you know, through this midlife crisis, it depends on what, what happens, which appear and predominate to the extent that it has been said that a person whose goodness has not become dominant over, uh, has not become dominant over his evil, the devil rubs his face and cries a face that will never succeed. He should prepare himself for the hellfire. So this is somebody's experience. Somebody said, I don't think this is from a hadith. It's just somebody's has been saying that the devil gets so happy of the person whose evil dominates the good, right? And 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 says this, he rubs the face and cries that this face will never succeed. He should prepare himself for the fire. Now we get some understanding of this from a verse which some have said refers to the age of forty as well. While actually others say that, no, that actually refers to the age of 60. Thank God. Allah says in Surah Fatir, verse 35 or 37. Did we not give you an age in which those who could have reflected would have reflected and the warner came to you? Now, by the age of 40 or 60, if this is about 60, then the warner is many things. Number one, age. The age acts as a warning. White hair acts as a warning. Becoming unflexible, inflexible, becoming uh, uh, more tired, uh, having symptoms of different illnesses, having to go to the doctor more, not being able to bear children. All of this is a warning. These are all natural warnings within us. Subhanallah.
So has not the warner come to you? And haven't we given you enough of a life in which those who wanted to reflect could have reflected, but you did not reflect? Now, as I said, the stronger view is actually that this is this verse in Surah Fatir is actually about 60. So don't worry about it too, too much until you, or, or well, you have to worry about it. Now, th this is, I'm going to, uh, you know, subhanAllah, I mean, you know, for us, it's, Allah, Allah. I'll tell you what happened with me, right? As I was getting to 39, okay, there were some really good things that happened, but there was a crisis that, look, I said, you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me, I've written several books, you know, I wrote my first book, I think at the age of 19 or 20 or something, right, while I was in the fourth year of the madrasa. And then, Alhamdulillah, you know, um, I've been teaching, I've had the opportunity to travel the world. By the age of 40, I'd had the opportunity to travel the world, giving dawah to different places. And, you know, I, Allah had given me a lot of respect and may Allah maintain that as well. But me personally, looking at myself, am I, I'm thinking, am I doing my tahajjud prayer? You know, am I doing my ishraq prayer? Am I doing this extra dhikr? Uh, you know, I'm, 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 alhamdulillah, I'm fulfilling the obligations and alhamdulillah, but am I doing what extra am I doing? You know, uh, am I what it, what I should be? Am I what other scholars were? You know, what other people were? That was a major, major problem for me. And I think for religious people, that's kind of the thought that you should have, right? Is that, is my good dominant over the evil? So alhamdulillah, then, you know, I made a bit of an effort at that time and, uh, there's several good things that happened. I mean, um, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he actually started teaching hadith at the age of 40. And somebody asked him why. He said, well, because the Prophet ﷺ got his prophecy at the age of 40. He became a prophet. So I think this is a good time to start teaching hadith. This doesn't mean that if you've got the opportunity to teach hadith before that, you don't. Alhamdulillah, I actually got the opportunity to start teaching Sahih al-Bukhari and so on at the age of 40 as well. You know, so I think that was a very lucky idea. That was a very lucky idea. Now, Imam um, uh, Sha'arani, right? So, so essentially what happened with me is that at the age of 40, I became more serious about the sawuf, I think. I became more serious about dhikr and things like that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still very, very weak. I'd like to become stronger. In fact, I think I was probably better off then than I am right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all better. And, uh, you know, make us better before we get to the age of 40. Make, give us a good life. Sheikh Abdul Wahab al-Sha'arani was a great, great scholar of Egypt last few hundred years ago. He states that, I'm going to just give you an idea of what, how others dealt with this. SubhanAllah, inshallah, it's an inspiration for us. He says, our oaths were taken that when reaching the age of 40, we folded our mats. Except when overpowered by sleep. Now, we're not going to fold our beds. I mean, our beds can't be folded. I mean, you know, our several hundred dollar pound mattresses, you know, with the this many springs and this many cool layers and this much memory foam. I mean, you're not going to fold that. I mean, these people, they just had a, a kind of a, a mat that they would throw out on the floor and sleep on there. So he said, we folded them up, except when overpowered by sleep, except when overpowered by sleep. And we constantly became aware that every breath, with every breath, that we were now travelers to the hereafter. It just became that uh, my journey is going to end. My journey is going to end. It's going to be the end of it. You know, when you go for a holiday, right? And you've got a week out or two weeks out. You're like, oh, I've got enough time. So you don't really look at your time. You're just enjoying yourself. Now, when it comes to the last day, right? You're like now counting the minutes. Oh, we're going to have to leave. We're going to have to leave. We're going to have to leave. Then the minutes become. It's like another one. I don't know if any of you have experienced this. You go to the... Mashallah, uh, you know, for Umrah or Hajj and the Zamzam is just abundantly everywhere. So you're drinking Zamzam, people are wasting it and all sorts, right? Now you've packed some for yourself. And as you depart from Makkah to go to Jidda to take, you know, to, to take your flight out, have you seen how valuable every ounce of Zamzam, every drop of Zamzam will become there, right? If you're lucky to have how much you have, because the abundance has gone down and now you, it becomes valuable. And it's the same kind of thing for these people. He said that we started, uh, you know, with constantly becoming aware with every breath that we are travelers to the hereafter. No rest remains, no repose for us, no competitions on any position of the world now, no joy over anything worldly because life narrows after 40. Allah, what a statement. Life is vast, extensive, expansive, broad. There's a lot of bandwidth. But now after 40, you actually start feeling like, you know what, how much have I got left? It starts becoming more 
like that as opposed to before it was that way now it becomes this way he said life narrows after 40. distraction and playing are inappropriate for a person who nears the battleground of death so death is going to come to us and that's going to be a battleground subhanallah subhanallah that's why these people have left a legacy because they thought like this imam malik right imam malik says that we know people who studied until the age of 40. They studied the deen until the age of 40, like diligently just focused on the deen, right? After which they occupied themselves with practice, no free time left. After that, they were just like, look, let me do extra nawafil prayer, let me make salat, let me do dhikr, let me do tasbih, you know, let me not, um, you know, do, uh, let, let me just focus on preparing my hereafter. Imam Shafi, Right. Uh, does anybody know at what age Imam Shafi'i died? I mean, he's one of the greatest of the Imams. He's a great faqih, a muhaddith, everything. Right. Does anybody know what age he died? He was born in uh, 150 Hijri. Right. And he died in 204 Hijri, which makes him 54 years of age, which I think, uh, you know, where I mean, some of us are actually close to that age. So Imam Shafi'i at the age of 40, he took a staff for walking. Now he doesn't need a, he doesn't need a staff for walking. Uh, a friend of mine who was with me in Hajj, he sent me a staff. I've not started using it, but this is an amazing staff. Allah bless him. Dr. Farooq from Chicago. It's a, he, he carried this in the Hajj. I mean, he's not, uh, he's not that old, but as a Sunnah, he carried this subhanAllah. And uh, Imam Shafi'i took a staff. Now, the problem in England is that somebody with my, uh, you know, how tall I am and with the clothing I wear, and if I take something like this, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what people are going to think. But when I've heard that, I was thinking, I, you know, it's to remind yourself. Imam Shafi at the age of 40 took a staff for walking. And somebody asked him, because he's young, he's 40 years old, he doesn't need a staff. He said, when somebody asked him, why are you taking a staff? He said, to remind myself that I am a traveler. Okay. Because travelers used to carry staffs, you know. I now see myself as a bird that has extricated himself from its cage until only the foot is left caught. I have no desire to remain in this world now. And I grant nobody permission. I grant no permission to any of my companions to give me anything or mention um, anything of the world or mention any of its affairs except what is legally necessary for me. This is Imam Shafi's approach. Uh, Wahhab ibn Munabbi, another one of our aslaf, right? They, he said, I have read somewhere that each morning a herald announces from the fourth heaven, O people of 40, you are a crop whose harvest is nigh, whose harvest is closed, meaning your, your crops are nearly ready to be cut. O people of 50, O people of 50, what have you sent ahead for yourself? And what have you kept back? You need to start thinking that. What have you sent forth? And O oh, people of 60, you have no more any excuse. You have no more excuse. And then he said, would, would that creatures had never been created. And if created and when created, they knew why they were created. The hour has come, so beware. Now in Arabic he says, "Inna munadi and yunadi min al sama al rabi'ati kull sabah, abna al arba'in, antum zar'un qaddana hasadu, abna al khamsin, mada qaddamtum wa mada akhartum, abna al sittin, la udra lakum, layt al khalq lam yuxlaqu, wa ida khuliqu." So that is that middle age. Okay, that is that middle age. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help it. I'm going through that age, right? And uh, may Allah make it easy. May Allah make it easy. So um, let us take a break here uh, for some questions. Um, Due to lifespan increase 
and medical science development, do you think the age ranges should or be tweaked? I understand the ones we discussed are per Ibn al -Jawzi. I don't know why would you want to change it? I mean, 35 is long enough. What difference does it make, to be honest? And to be honest, the only, uh, you know, most of these ages, the only significant one that has a significant impact in terms of uh, the Sharia is the age, the maturity age, right? Which basically means that, um, so, so look, if, if uh, you know what they have said is that if someone is eating a lot of rich foods or a lot of intense foods and so on then they could start menstruating early now if they start menstruating early at the age of nine well by the they say that before nine we're not gonna accept that somebody could you know we're, even if somebody menstruates we're gonna call that a sickness of some sort or whatever we're not gonna say that they are legally mature yet however after the age of nine, if, if a girl menstruates, we're going to say that this, uh, you, you know, we're, we're going to say that uh, you are mature now. OK, uh, so it's it, the Sharia has already that in it. You know, at the end of the day, the Sharia already has that in it. So I don't think we need to change. Now, at the age of youth, at 35, there's no really difference. That's just a significant point. You know, you're not going to be punished more or less at that. It's only that the age of 60, which I think is sufficient anyway. So I don't think there's any. You can say religious commands and injunctions that are related to any of the other ages except the age of maturity, which fluctuates anyway. There's not a hard, fast date. It's just that if you don't haven't shown any physical signs, all right, uh, of you know impregnation or ejaculation or whatever it is, or you know men, uh, men, menstruation, then by the age of 14 years and seven months, uh, or is it 14 years and nine months? Or is it 14 years and seven months? Uh, 15 years, uh, 15 Islamic years, then you are now considered mature. The next question, uh, if a child from a non-Muslim family passes away, will the child go to Jannah? There's several opinions about that as well. But again, I think one of the strong opinions there also is that they will also be in paradise, inshallah, even the children of non-Muslims. How do we how how to be disciplined, mentally strong in doing qada prayer, especially when a person has so many years to make up? Yeah, you know, mashallah, I've dealt with quite a few people uh, who've done their qada prayers. OK. And mashallah, there's one friend of mine who had about seven years left uh, some years ago when I discussed. And the last time I discussed with him, he had a very short amount left. Alhamdulillah, I know a lot of people have completed it. So there's a few ways to do it. You can either say that with every Fajr prayer of today, I'm going to do a Fajr Qadha or two Fajr Qadhas. One before I pray today's Fajr, one after it. Uh, likewise, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib. Some people have found that uh, to work. Others have found that it's actually easier and more you can say uh, you, you feel more accomplished if you do it um, if you do it in a way that uh, you first do all of your fajrs so if somebody says they've got 300 fajrs to make up you do you know five or ten in a day and then when you finish your 300 or whatever fajrs they are then you can at least say okay alhamdulillah i'm free in my fajr now let me start my dhuhr Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Witr prayer. Okay, so some people have found that to be easy. There are actually quite a few apps online. Um, the Qadha, they call them Qadha Umri apps. Qadha Umri apps. Right? You can use them. But don't get too obsessed with the number. Do a general estimation first that I've got this many. And then just go with that number. Just work with that number. And then when you do that, you can always do more preca for precaution afterwards. Don't try to get like, oh, what exactly is it? Just give an estimation. Okay. So that's uh, that's the way you do it. And just keep in mind that, you know, if we can finish that qadav, it's a major achievement in life. There's a huge burden that comes away from us. Yeah. Anybody who's got questions, you know, please use the questions feature. Ask a question feature, which I think should be at the bottom of your screens. All right. How can everyone be a leader? I don't think it means leader in what you're talking about, like in that kind of leader is lead their life in a, a way, lead a life of their family, lead, uh, do something useful in the world, even on a partial level. It's not talking about becoming Donald Trump or the president of the United States or, you know, of the UN or, or a big company or, S, you know, and, uh, you, you know, to become like a CEO. It doesn't necessarily mean that, although that rings true here as well. OK, um, it's talking about just at least getting something, being able to be in control of your life, right? And of course, if it's talking about people with huge ideas, then, well, they better start it young, all right? 
generally speaking, that's what works. But if not, uh, you, you know, if it's not talking about that, it's obviously talking about uh, anybody for their life. Do I pray fard rakats kada or full fard rakat sunnah? No, you just uh, in every prayer, it's just the fard elements that you have to repeat. Except in the Hanafi school, you have to repeat the witr as well, the three rakats of witr. If I have lost my child before he reached puberty, is it true that a child will take us to Jannah? Is this condition applicable to parents who are not religious as well? With anything that's mentioned like that, it's always about, um, you can say, another opportunity, another advantage, another incentive. So it's to help women, uh, women and men grieve less, obviously, uh, over their loss. And obviously, that's not like guaranteed that you will just they will just grab you into Jannah, even though you've been, you know, somebody's been uh, a, a massive sinner, right? Obviously, the child is there to take the person that will be there. The child is there waiting for their parents to come. I'm going to grab you and take you to paradise. And there's numerous stories related about this as well, where the child was waiting to take them. But all of these other sins came up in, hum you know, in some kind of animate form and saying, no, we can't let you go. We can't let you go. We can't let you go. Right. So, yes, the child is prepared to take you, you know, to take a person. But if there are sins that are serious, then they will prevent the child. And then it depends on who's stronger, whether the sin is worse than this. So uh, I guess that should help uh, explain the situation. But yes, there's a hadith about it that if a person loses their child, uh, uh, you know, who die at a young age, then those ch children, mashallah, will be there ready to take people into paradise. You know, their, their parents in paradise. Do we make up miss prayers do you make them up in order you don't have to make them in if you've missed more than five prayers then you're not obligated to make them up in any particular order all right um, but if they're current prayers that if you are uh, if you don't have more than five prayers to make up then we do need to make the prayers up in order which means that if i've got into the masjid and i then remember that you know what i actually overslept in fajr today i'm not allowed to join the congregation until i quickly do my fajr on the side quickly my two rakats i know it's going to look a bit weird people are going to be wondering what you're doing is uh, if there's no sunnas before it right uh, of that prayer then i'll do my fajr then i'll join in otherwise if i make that new prayer uh, knowing that i've got one or two or three or four prayers missed that i haven't prayed then um, that prayer also becomes invalid. I have to repeat all of them. And then there's some other complicated ways of dealing with that. So yeah, that's only for people who've got less than five or less prayers that they've missed in their balance of current prayers. Um, if you miss Isha and wake you for Fajr, do you pray Fajr first then Isha? Yeah, you, you pray Isha first then Fajr. The only time this drops is that if you woke up, if you're right at the end of the prayer time, and if I went to do my Fajr, I'd miss Maghrib. Or if I went to do my Isha, then I would miss my Fajr prayer because I've woken up five minutes before sunrise. Then in that case, I will do my Fajr so I don't miss two prayers. At that time, the order becomes dropped. So I pray my Fajr, sunrise, I wait, and then I pray my Isha afterwards. Do our Nafal prayers count towards our Fard prayers we have missed? No. What they count as is that if we've had shortcomings inside the prayer itself, where we didn't do something properly, we didn't have the full observance and um, the full concentration then some parts of the nafal and optional prayers can be used to kind of uh, you can say make this more wholesome but they do not because you need an intention for fard prayers to be absolved okay so they 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 don't automatically count otherwise i, I would assume that most people have probably prayed many prayer people are, who pray have probably prayed more optional prayers than they have a fard because the fard are a minority with every Muslim who did not commit shirk and ask for forgiveness for his or her shirk, go to Jannah. Yes, every single believer, right, even the worst of them all, who absolutely did not do any good deeds at all, he just had la ilaha illallah in his heart, that's it. He will be given eventually, he or she will be given eventually, 10 times the size of this world. So the mercy of Allah is there. There's a lot of real estate out there and he's there to give. I think paradise is much more bigger than hellfire. Hellfire is very restricted. Paradise is huge, right? As I said, the last person to ever live on this, the biggest sinner to ever have lived on this earth from Adam Ali Sam's times to now, I think even he, according to the hadith, gets 10, ten times the size of this world, but after being messed up in hellfire, okay? So, but yes, every believer will eventually go to paradise. 
Sheikh at 39, my husband had a massive stroke and left him uh, para, paraplegic, if that's the right way of saying it. He only has one use of one hand and that's only half the story. At 40, I was questioning everything. But Alhamdulillah, I feel like Allah has opened my eyes to a lot. I feel like I'm awake. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it further easy for you. And maybe you can write about your story for other people who, who are in similar situations to benefit from. You know, Allah subhanAllah, if you've done, if you have a good heart and you're trying to do the best and you call out to Allah, right, He will help you. I've seen, I've seen, you know, parents with children who are disabled, who have syndromes, uh, you know, and, and all the rest of it. And the world doesn't want them. You know, subhanAllah, the world, the, 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 in the West, they try to do a Down syndrome test and they kill so many, like a million babies or something are killed in Europe. Three million? I, I can't remember what the number is. Of these really innocent Down syndrome babies. And Down syndrome people are so cute. There's so much dua, there's so much rahmah and mercy that comes out because of that. Because of that. Uh, where sometimes a lot of people don't like old people in their home, right? But you get more baraka with the old and the frail and the weak and the young. That's where you get blessing from. And what I've seen is, you know, I've got a, uh, I've got a, uh, somebody I know who's got a child who's now over 10 years old, over 10 years old, right, with Rett syndrome, which is quite a difficult one. There's so much they have to do. But I'm amazed that I'm, I'm amazed that what courage Allah gives people to look after, what love Allah gives. Subhanallah. If you're a good person and you want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you ask Allah for help, he, Allah, la yukallifullahu nafsan illa usaha. If Allah is going to give you a difficulty like that, inshallah, He is going to give you the ability to deal with it as well, inshallah. And if not, he, if you ask Him, He will give it to you. Kindly explain the two angels on the show, please. I'm a little confused whether they have any names or they are just called Kiram and Katibin. There's no names. I don't think they have like a specific name. They're just known as the noble writers. Now, among them, they might have, they might be Abdurrahman's angels, A and B, right? Or one and two. Uh, and uh, Basira's, you know, and uh, who else have we got here? Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, who's this? Ishrat's, right? Ishrat's angels. They, they're very just called Ishrat's angels. I don't think there's, uh, I don't know of any name. I mean, they've been given descriptive names describing what they do. Raqib, Atid, Kiram, and Katibin, but I don't think they have a name. I don't think it matters. It doesn't change their job if they had a name or not. But again, between them, they might have a name. Wallahu a'ala. What happens or how can you compensate for missed prayers for one that is deceased? Yeah, you give fidya. Now, the thing is that if, you know, right now with all what's going on, I think you should, you should encourage if there is somebody in your family who's about to pass away or who may, you know, you should encourage them to bequest these things, to write a will for these things. Because if they write a will, then from up to one third of their estate, um, money should be spent for this. And of course, the family members all together can spend more than that if they want to, if they're all in agreement or an individual can actually pay on their behalf, right? So if the, the mas'ala, the, the, the ruling is that if they have uh, left a will to that effect, then it will be counted on their behalf and they can be forgiven. But if they didn't and a child, uh, the, one of their children wants to do that, they can do that and hope that it will be accepted. Hope that will be accepted, but it's not 100%, but it's hope because... If the child has that kind of a mind to do that, maybe some part of the tarbi of the parents is involved in there and they get the benefit of that. But the amount is essentially the same amount that you pay for sadaqatul fitr, which is between three to five pounds a prayer. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A friend of ours moved to a different city during the time of COVID. Since I was unable to invite them over and offer them a farewell dinner, the friend always reminds me that he will bear witness to this fact on the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar. Nazneen, you are in big trouble, it seems. How am I supposed to feel about this? He does say he does say jokingly, and whoever listens to it laughs aloud. I don't find it funny. I don't know why he does that. I and subhanAllah, I am I apologize for you know, I apologize for making this more serious than it is. You don't have to worry at all. There's no obligation uh, to that effect. And I think if you don't like it, then maybe just tell them to stop saying that. But Again, I don't know. I mean, is it because you get upset that they're just leading them on and he wants to carry on or she wants to carry on? Maybe just write to them and say, please stop saying that. You know what? You know what I would say to a person like that if I want to stop? Can you please send me your bank details? I will transfer you over and no, give me your address and I will have some 
food shipped to you, right? I'll have some food shipped to you. If you really want food, here you go. Here's the qada of it. Here you go. Take the food, man, and stop bothering me about it. That's probably what I would do if they keep going on about it. What do you think? You think that's uh, you can do that? Just just tell them, look, stop doing it. It's it's just it's not a joke anymore. And if they carry on, just say, look, give me your address and I'll and I'll send you some foods. And that's your dawah done. Never heard about that. I mean, I've heard of uh, you know giving dawah to people that when they come in town, but to go out, I don't know. There's people make up all sorts of things, excuses for eating. Is it okay for your qada uh, to do qada first in any prayer time? Yes, absolutely. You can do qada first. In fact, the beautiful thing about qada is that you can even do it during fajr time and even after fajr time finishes until sunrise. At sunrise, you can't do it. Even asr time, you can do it. Uh, you, uh, you know, until 20 minutes before asr, until the sky becomes red. For a boy without aql, autism, must he grow a beard and a and and likewise for a girl and hijab? Well, if I mean it depends. I mean, there's lots of autistic children, and they don't all. Uh, they they actually not all aqalless. Uh, the autistic children that I know, some of them are very intelligent, right? But if you're talking about somebody who actually cannot think for themselves at all, then why would they shave anyway? Like if they're not thinking, then why don't you let them just groom their beard, right? Why, you know, and likewise hijab. Let us put it this way. Um, it's their guardians that would have some form of responsibility, I guess, right? Depending on their state, but we'd need to know a, a bit more about their state to uh, exactly to be able to, you know, figure out the proper answer. Is is an autistic child who reaches puberty liable to pray for? It depends. I mean, as I said, there's children who, mashallah, some autistic children, they they, they, they may be a bit, um, uh, if they don't get it, like if they don't get it, if they don't understand it, then they're not responsible until they become, you know, understanding. They must comprehend what they're doing. So let's put it that way. Let's make it easy. Can we pray our qadha salah instead of praying our sunnah? In the Hanafi salat, you, in the Hanafi perspective, you can't replace your sunnah mu'akkada with that, technically speaking. How to make a teenage boy realize they should come into the lightened path if they're realizing they're going off on the path? You know, that's a big that's a big discussion. And um, that's a big discussion. That's all about tarbiyah of children. And I, there's not one answer that fits all because it really depends on what's happened until now. Why do they think otherwise? What are they exactly doing? What is the relationship? There's a lot of factors there. So I don't think I can give like a straightforward, simple answer to that. So you said qada has to be done in order if it's less than is there other madhabs that pray qada after the pray prayer? I don't know about other madhab. I'm not sure. Um, what should one do if one miss prayer for a few years? You make them up, right? You figure out how many you've got and you make them up. I'm turning 50 this year. What should I do as far as sadaqah jariyah to benefit me in the hereafter? Yes, mashallah. That's the subject that I want to cover before Ramadan. So look out on Zamzam Academy. Dot com because I'm going to be covering a lot of stuff about this because I think it's about time our 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 ummah in the Western world is mature enough now at that age we've been around there 60 70 years now and it's time we started leaving sadaqah jariya legacies the best sadaqah jariya you have to think about this the best sadaqah jariya you can leave is something that is going to remain for the longest period so one is you can do something for the poor give some money to the poor build a masjid right now in a masjid, people will continue to pray. If you build a madrasa, if you if you pay for scholarship, then the benefit is that anybody that studies there, then everybody that you see, when a person comes to the masjid, they study in the masjid. If there's things being taught in the masjid as well, then that proliferates even more. But I think one of the biggest after masjids is our madrasas, our educational training grounds, right? Places like White Thread um, and Al Qasim. Um, sorry, uh, uh, what is it? Um, the one in Chicago, you know, and these kind of places, this is where ulama are trained because they're going to lead the ummah. Imagine if they train 50 ulama, 50 ulama are going to benefit, I don't know, you know, how many thousand people. And then those people will benefit others. So it's it's huge. Just try to look for something. And I would, that's where I would put my money, I think. Are qadar prayers forgiven like other sins are if one repents? No. Um, because it's there's a balance for it and if you miss it then you have to repeat it so you you can't really say that it's gonna cover it up like that uh, the, the, there's a job to do that's why it's not like okay you know I um, yeah it, it, that, that doesn't if I said something uh, if I wasted my time that could be forgiven just like that because there's no act that I can do to replace that 
How do I deal? Now, there is an opinion out there that people quote from, it was from a Zahiri, a literally scholar of the past called Ibn Hazm al Zahiri. I think it was from him. That Qadha prayers is such a heinous crime that you cannot make them up. It doesn't work. There's no point. But that's a minority opinion. He says you only have to make Tawbah, but that's a minority opinion. The majority opinion, all four schools of thought, and the vast, broad, consensus you could say to a certain degree is that you must repeat the prayer and then you make tawbah as well okay how do i deal with my teacher who keeps lying to me instead of schoolwork he does other things <sighs> to be honest i wish i could give you a straight simple answer but you i just need to understand you know what it is why does he lie in the first place where does this lying come from you know you know, my, my children bend the truth a bit, but I, they try not to lie. You know, they try to bend it because we've just considered that a very serious issue in the house. So I think you might want to sit him down and say, look, don't lie. Just tell me the truth and I won't, won't do this or whatever. Right. Just say the truth to me. OK. Um, and, and try to think of more ingenious ways of doing that. Simple, simple answer if that's the case, inshallah. So Alhamdulillah, we've covered until about the age of 50, which was the uh, youth and then the middle life and now we move on to seniority which is from the age of 50 to 70 i'm just going to hurry this up it doesn't look like there's many people of that age here but i'm going to mention that quickly so we can actually get to the next section as well so manhood uh, which is uh, uh, between 50 and 70. allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran surah ghafir thumma yukhrijukum tiflan thumma litablughu ashuddakum thumma litakunu shuyukha wa minkum man yutawaffa min qabl wa litablughu sorry wa litablughu ajalan musamman wa la'allakum ta'qilun allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you out into this world as a child as an infant and then after that you reach your age of strength and then after that you become old shuyukh you become old you reach seniority and then from among you are some who die before this though right so some of you aren't going to reach the age of 70 subhanallah there's so many people who who we've lost recently right in in covid and allah then says but it's for you to reach an age a moment a period right which is designated and fixed and so that you gain some kind of understanding so that you shall reach an appointed term allah has an appointed term for everybody so anybody that has died in covid all right at a young age and you know don't be led to believe that they have died earlier than their appointed term allah knew exactly when they were going to die i know it feels a bit bad that somebody dies in a state uh, you know in an unhealthy state but really now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam term termed the period between 6 to, to 70 uh, as uh, basically he said that hasadu ummati bayna sitin was sab'in the reaping of my nation my ummah is between 60 and 70 that most people this is the age is going to be between 60 and 70 i know some people go beyond that some people die before that as well but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he termed the period between 670 as mu'tarakul manaya basically the time which is the battleground of death right um, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself actually passed away at the age of 63 so did abu bakr as-siddiq radiyallahu an so did umar radiyallahu an and so did ali radiyallahu an just uthman radiyallahu an who lived past the age of 80 he didn't die at 60 all that, but otherwise all that i mean would you say then that's a sunnah age of dying age of 63 and subhanallah, I remember that there was a shaykh who, you know, tried to do everything according to the sunnah. And a lot of his followers, they actually thought that they were going to lose him at the age of 63. I don't know, I don't know exactly where the idea came from and had started from, but a lot of his followers were, had this discussion that he's going to be 60. This was some years ago, that he's going to be 63. He's going to die at the age of 70, 63. I don't think you can say that that's a sunnah age to die because you don't have death in your control. But I guess if somebody does die at the age of 63, they can at least have some hope that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, wants me to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa or whatever. There's nothing, nothing wrong with having personal done about these things, but there's no guarantee. So anyway, when you get to the age of 60, the verse which I discussed earlier, 
أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرْ وَجَاءَكُمُ النَّذِينَ That definitely applies there. The strongest opinion is that, uh, as Allah says, that did we not give you the life, did we not give you the age in which the one who wanted to reflect could have reflected and the warner came to you? Then after that, there's a, a really interesting hadith, very frightening hadith actually. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah. Um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أعذر الله إلى امرئ أخر الله أجله حتى بلغ الستين. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will give excuses, will accept the excuses of somebody who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has delayed their death, their 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 time of death uh, until they reach sixteen. Sorry, sixty. So there's excuses for Tawbah. Allah will accept your excuses, but if you reach the age of sixty and you're still messing around then that's an issue. Now this Ummah, interestingly, this Ummah, and I mean for hundreds of years, right? Thousands of years, maybe, no, well, at least over a thousand years, 1500, 1400 years we've had already, 1442 years or whatever, has the shortest life. People earlier on, much, much, much earlier on, they would live for a thousand years. And those people would actually mature, they say, at the age of 80, not at the age of 14, right? Comparatively speaking. Some of Adam Ali Salam's son passed away at 200 years age, and others felt sorry for him that he's passed away so young. Right now, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam beseeched Allah subhanahu wa taala that my nation has a very, very, very short period, it has a very, very short span of life. So, do you know what Allah subhanahu wa taala gave him in place of that? Because he didn't expand the life, but there's something else he gave, which will amount to a lot more than many, many thousand years if you take advantage of it. He gave them Laylatul Qadr. Jazakallah khair. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Okay. So that Laylatul Qadr will be coming in about two and a half to three months. You know, we have exactly about two months left for Ramadan. Rajab has begun. Okay. So you've got Rajab and Sha'ban, then Ramadan is around the corner again. May Allah give us, the, may Allah bless these months for us so that we can get out of the way anything which is going to occupy us so that Ramadan will be free, inshallah. And may Allah make Ramadan a wonderful Ramadan this year, right? Okay, this is a period in which people begin to resort to just worship. You know, this age by, you know, after 60, then people are like, okay, I need to sit in the masjid. I need to be praying. I need to do itikaf. I need to give more sadaqah. I need to repent. You know, people are saying, I need to now cover properly. I need to have beards. You know, there's all of this stuff people are trying to do. They renounce the world. They do, they try to do utmost obedience, avoid jest. Um, one of those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at, speak to or purify on the day of rising right is an adulterous old man a sheikh azani like what's wrong with you you've had so much of your life you could have done whatever you've done then and you're still doing zina at this age you know it doesn't mean that you can do it at a younger age but it's just saying that i mean by that age when you're so messed up and you're so frail and everything you're still trying to do that then it says if somebody does not conform to this you know generally by this age you know when somebody becomes 70 60 to 70 and they're still not conforming to the power pa pattern of becoming more religious you know becoming more associated with their deen doing good things stopping bad things then people generally look on these people and think like what's wrong with this guy like you know has any reason so that's why one man was undergoing a heart surgery right and when he was brought back to consciousness he's an old man he said let me t check where my stocks are right since, his, since all of his investment was in shares or Bitcoin or whatever, I would expect that today as well. And I mean, if you're, you know, doing Bitcoin or whatever the case is, uh, cryptocurrencies or stocks or whatever, especially right now, when it's so volatile, right? And if you were in a coma for a while or in unconscious, you wake up, it's like, where is it right now? That That's the problem with these kind of things that they're not gambling, they're halal in most cases, but um, they, they become like gambling in the sense that the, the attitude towards them because you're constantly just waiting for fluctuation right and it's not there's no serious backing behind it this is the issue with these things anyway by this time now you know white hair appears and dominate for many I mean white hair is actually supposed to be a source of light 
the first person they say whose hair actually turned white was Ibrahim alayhi salam and he asked what is this so Allah said this is dignity so he said Lord give me more dignity subhanallah white hair and so on is actually just a reminder of the nearness of the end of time which is the banisher of hopes death is the banisher of hopes there's a poem whose name was Khatib ibn Nabata he said Ala inna shayba thagharul hayati alladhi la yumkinu sawaduhu wa la yuslihu dahru fasadahu Ala inna shayba thagharul hayati alladhi la yumkinu sawaduhu wa la yuslihu dahru fasadahu that uh, white grayness of the, the hair, whiteness of the hair, it's, this is such a hole in life. It creates such a hole in life. La yumkinu sadaduhu, which is not possible to correct. And time will no longer fix this corruption. Subhanallah. Yes, you can put, what do you call it, dye in your hair, but uh, there's nothing that's going to stop it anymore. And then he says, وَهُوَ نُورٌ طَالِعٌ بِأُفُولِ النَّسَمِ سَائِرٌ بِالْأَشْخَاسِ إِلَى مَحَلِّ الرِّمَمِ فَلَا تُحَرِّكُوا رَحِمَكُمُ اللَّهِ نُورَ مَشِيبَتِكُمْ بِنَارِ ذُنُوبِكُمْ Ya Allah, make this a lesson for us. He said, it is a rising, the, the, the whiteness of the hair is a rising of the light, the illumination of a believer, right? بِأُفُولِ النَّسَمِ Which basically means white hair, uh, the, the whole poem is white hair is a hole in life which cannot be plugged and whose worsening cannot be repaired by time it is a light that rises as the breath of life sets it's a mover of people to the place of rotten bones do not may Allah have mercy on you burn the light of your white hair with the fire of your sins should be ashamed a white uh, and that's why in our tradition right a white a person with white hair should be honored that's why the prophet sallallahu said that if you honor somebody with white hair then allah will have somebody honor you when you're in that state right so alhamdulillah our deen has it all okay now let's move on to the next stage which is al haram wal kibr decrepitude so if somebody does get to the age of 70 and over but for some people, decrepitude starts even earlier, right? And this is until death now. This is when a person becomes weak in their senses. Some people age earlier, right? So they become weak in their senses. They become weak in their limbs, their faculties. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allahu ladhi khalaqakum min du'fin, thumma ja'ala min ba'di du'fin quwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you, uh, you know, in a state of weakness, from weakness. Then after this weakness, he gave you strength. But after this strength, which is your middle age, then the weakness and the shayba, the seniority and all of that comes in. He creates whatever he wishes and he is the all, uh, all aware, all knowing and the absolutely powerful, omnipotent one. Allah then says in Surah Al-Hajj, وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرَدُّ إِلَىٰ أَرْضَ لِلْعُمُرِ and some of you will be returned to all evil old age so that they would end up not knowing anything after having had knowledge. A poet says, Which basically means that if 70 is your sickness, then you're going to find no doctor till you die for removing that sickness. So if your sickness is being 70 years of age, then there's no doctor for that age. All right. Truly a man who has reached 70 years is leaving never to his uh, final resting place. Well, you, you see right now, the big race, you know, from... The, those who uh, started uh, PayPal and all these other people who've made a huge amount of money, where are they putting their money? They're putting it on longevity studies. There's a huge amount of investment in longevity studies. One is the space race, uh, not race, but the, you know, taking the normal people to space, there's that. You know, Elon Musk, all those guys are doing that. Then there's a whole group of people who are putting huge amounts of money in longevity studies. All right. And there's a lot of philosophy behind this to actually think about it. And one of the ideas there, which is quite prominent, is that 
if you were going to live forever, your this life wouldn't be the way it is right now. So you couldn't be the same person you are right now and think the same way or get more excitement if you're going to live forever. It's going to get boring, they say. It's just going to... Because there's a whole element of surprise of, you know, a race and all of this kind of stuff. I've not got the time to deal with that right now. But if you do, if you do a search online on longevity studies, you'll actually see it, the discussion about that. You know, Ma'an Ma ibn Zaida once entered to visit Ma'mun al-Rashid. Ma'mun al-Rashid, I think, is the uh, he is the son of Harun al-Rashid, and he's one of the big Abbasid Khalifs. Okay, so Ma'an ibn Zaida, he once went to meet Ma'mun. Okay, now Ma'mun asked him, he was quite old, he's quite old, this Ma'an ibn Zaida, and he said to him, in what state has old age led you? To what state has old age led you? Now, this is a really interesting summation of old age. May Allah protect us from this age, but it's it's like a warning. That's what I'm saying. I know for some, many of us are thinking like, we're talking about the age of 70 or whatever the case is, you know. That's a long way to go. But these are really eye-openers so that we can prepare. He replied, this Ma'an ibn Zayda was very old. He replied that this old age has led me to stumbling on a lump of dung and being wounded by a, by a hair, a strand of hair, okay? So then he asked him, okay, how are you with food and drink and sleep? He replied, when I am hungry, I am angry. And when I, I, am eat, when I eat, I am not content. I become drowsy in company and sleepless when I go to bed. When I'm sitting with people, I start sleeping, slumbering. But when I go to bed, I cannot sleep. Right? So then he asked him, how are you with your, with your women? He replied, the ugly among them I have no wish for, and the pretty have no wish for me. Ma'moon then said to him, the likes of you, people like you should no longer be on duty. Maybe he was working in the royal court or whatever. He said, people like you no longer should be on duty, right? Give him twice as much as his provision and his stipend or whatever it is, and let him stay at home. Decrepitude, decrepitude, right, is, is tough. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from this state. You know, many of our old people, I keep, I've kept hearing them saying, Allah kisi ka muhtaj na banaye, which basically means may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never make us dependent upon anybody. May Allah allow us to leave from this world in an independent state where I can still do things for myself and I'm not bedridden for seven years, bedridden for five years or 10 years or 15 years, troubling everybody around, but nobody can do anything about it, you know, and subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. May Allah make it easy. May Allah make it easy. Let us go into the third life. Now person has died. People have died. What's going on in that stage? This is an interesting stage because after this stage comes the day of judgment, the fourth life, and then comes paradise and hell, hell, paradise and hell which is the sixth life. Okay? So, وَمِن وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يبعثون. From death to the moment a person rises from the grave. That's the life of the barzakh. Barzakh has already started for everybody who's died until now from the first person. Uh, they're already in Barzakh. Our Barzakh will start when we die. Okay? So that will start from when we go into our grave, when we die, until the horn is blown. A Muslim upon dying, you know, there's a, we give them Talqeen. Nowadays, unfortunately, people are stuck in hospitals. We can't even give them Talqeen. If we would be very lucky if there's a Muslim chaplain around. Otherwise, there's horror stories of how people are dying in hospitals. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us away from that and remove this pandemic from us. So anyway, the idea is that when a person is about to die, we do talqeen, which is that we encourage them to read the kalima, la ilaha illallah. All right. And when somebody dies, we should read inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, which essentially is... A reminder for ourselves that look, they've died, but we we are we also belong to Allah. We're also going to go as well. So it's a reminder for us. Then it's a good idea to speak about the good things about a person who's died. That's why the hadith uh, says that Udkuru mahasina mautakum. 
wa kufu an masawihim remember the the excellent good points of your deceased and abstain from speaking about their bad unless you know there's a specific reason to do so in the barzakh as i told you before when the spirit is in the in the realm of the the spirits it's only a spirit there's no body when we come into this world there's a spirit and a body we are spirits and bodies the body is dominant the spirit is subordinate but still there's a strong connection in the barzakh the spirit now becomes dominant the ruh becomes dominant and the body becomes subordinate because in some people they don't even have bodies they've been decomposed they've been um what do you call it uh cremated, they've been consumed, whatever the case is. So the soul becomes primary in this case, the rule. But the bodies will also share in the experiences of grief, torment, felicity, joy, and so on. The spirits will endure this and the bodies will decay and gradually dissolve until the lowest, lowermost portion of the spine remains from, the per from which the person will be recreated on the day of judgment. I think it's called the coccyx i think it's called or the coccyx uh, i forget what it's called exactly or this could be which can hold some of the dna of a person because the person will be recreated the only exception to this the only people do not become decomposed by the ground the ground is forbidden you know to consume them are the martyrs those who have actually died fighting in the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a true battle and number two the prophets that's why allah says in the quran wala tahsaban alladhina qutilu do not ever, ever consider those people who've died in the path of Allah that they are dead, but they are very much alive. They're alive and they're being actually even sustained and pure uh, and, and provided from their Lord. A hadith says that when a janaza has been placed and the people carry the janaza, if it is the funeral, of a righteous person then that that funeral beer says qaddimuni qaddimuni quickly hurry me up put it put, take me forward take me forward but if it's non righteous it will then say ya wailaha ila aina tusri'un and no ila aina tadhhabuna biha oh woe be uh, woe be to it destruction be to it where are you taking it so that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Asri'u bil janaza, hasten with the janaza. Don't delay in burial. Try to have your deceased buried as soon as possible. Because if they are righteous, then it's good what your uh, you know, there's a good life. Sorry, there's a good uh the next stage is good for them that you're basically advancing them towards. And if they're bad, then you need to hasten so that you can get rid of the evil from your shoulders, from your midst. Now, what's really interesting is that the deceased people, when they died, they, according to many traditions and narrations we have, they actually perceive what's going on around them. So when you're giving them ghusl, they could actually feel that. They could know that you're giving them ghusl. Because we know for sure that when they're buried in the grave, right, they listen, they can hear you. Now, whether every single deceased person will hear everything, Allah knows best. But there's clear hadith about it. The Prophet wasallam said something to those who, those uh, disbelieving leaders who'd been captured after the Battle of Badr, in the Battle of Badr, and when they were in the well, he started saying that, did you find what you were promised by your Lord to be true? So the Sahaba, they said, why are you speaking to the dead? And I said, don't think that you can hear any better than they can so they can hear that's why it's agreed that the deceased can hear how much whether they hear all the time allah knows best so be careful okay when you bathe the deceased and so on as well that's why uh you place the grave in the deceased slightly towards the qibla on zamzam academy if somebody can post it we've got the whole procedure of how to place them in the grave all right uh and uh, the grave and and the prayer and all that we've got all of that on so you can you can see it if you want to learn about it okay and then and then what you do is you're gonna everybody should at least put three handfuls of soil in and we say bismillah wa ala millati rasulillah minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum 
وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى We say in the name of Allah, you know, when you're placing the body, you say uh, in the name of Allah and upon a deen of messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that it's, it's saying good words basically for the disease. And then when we're putting that, uh, again, it's a reminder for us, we're saying that from this soil did we create you, to it we're returning you, and then from it we're going to recreate you another time, which is in the hereafter. Thereafter, the people stand there and then they pray for steadfastness, right? For the deceased person, because that's as soon as you uh, you put the soil down over it, the questioning begins, right? The munkar and nakir come. And again, which one is munkar and which one is nakir? Does anybody know? There's two angels that come, munkar and nakir. Does anyone know which one is munkar and which one is nakir? Again, they both mean something similar. In munkar, nakir, something is someone that you cannot recognize, right? Or somebody very ugly. Now that this depends if they come in a good form. Uh, if a person has been good, they'll come really in a nice form with a good welcome, all right? And uh, if uh, uh, if uh, if they're bad, then they're going to come in some really scary form. Allah, 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 Allah. Allah. So they will ask three questions: Man Rabbuk, wa ma dinuk, wa man nabiyuk. Who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who is your prophet? Now, who is your prophet? They're gonna. There's opinions that that, 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 that it shows that you'll actually be shown a picture of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or from your grave to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, everything will be opened up so that you'll be given a vision. And if you had, I mean, we we've never seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but for a believer, they will just have the intuition to say, "This is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." That he is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the Qabr is either a pit of hell or a garden or orchard of paradise Uthman would have his beard drenched with tears whenever uh, he was at a grave so when he was asked he replied that I've heard the Prophet ﷺ saying that Al-Qabru awwalu manzilin min manazil al-akhirah the grave is the first of the stages of the hereafter if a person is able to escape this part and do well in this part then after that it becomes even easier but if he doesn't, then what comes after is even worse. Then we've got numerous hadith about this section, but we can't go into all that detail because we're coming to an end. And the other thing, what we're doing right now, is that Hellfire, we're, we've got another series on paradise on its own, which is, uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, it's called, uh, um, it's called, I'm going to take your questions now, but I just want to mention these so that people can have this. Paradise and its delights. That's what it's called. Paradise and its delights. And the other thing that we're doing right now is that every, uh, what is it? Every Tuesday. Yeah, every Tuesday, we are covering. Uh, it's going to be like a fifteen week, just fifteen week, uh, fifteen hours at least on Hellfire. Everything to do with Hellfire from some of the most important books on this subject by Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. All right. So you can you can take part in that. Um, you can get the information from our Zamzam Academy and other places and you can listen to that live It starts at 8.30, 8.30 on Tuesday evenings, which is UK time. All right, so um, I'm not leaving you in the lurch, you know, at your leisure you can read this stuff inshallah. So anyway, what I'm gonna do now is uh, You should read Yasin for uh, those people who die, finish a Quran if you can um, and um, I'm, let, let me leave you with something very simple, right? We've got 76 people here listening live right now. Uh, do you know one of the most simplest ways that you can benefit your loved ones who've passed away and your teachers? One of the most simplest ways that's not going to cost you much at all, but it's going to amount to a huge amount, right? If I do this, will you please remember me, inshallah? You can intend your parents, grandparents, and your teachers and if you can just in you know intend this sin sinful uh, needy individual here right after every prayer just read three times kul huwa allahu ahad three times kul huwa allahu ahad after every prayer and just say oh allah send the blessings of this send the reward of this to my parents and so on and my teachers and just include me in that and you will see that you do that five times a day it's gonna, you know, over a year, it's gonna count to so much. It's gonna count to so much. 
and let us teach our children to do this for us as well so um i'm gonna leave it there unfortunately we weren't able to complete the rest of it but i've given you now sources where you can discuss all of that inshallah where all of that you can have if there's a chance in the future maybe you know we'll cover the rest of it but for now i'm gonna ask say your questions inshallah um learn meaning of the quran go on to zamzam academy you've got a series on there about the uh, the quran 30 30 jews in 30 days it's one juice for one hour approximately. Uh, you might be able to, inshallah, benefit from that. Uh, maybe somebody can put that up. Uh, it's called 30 hours uh, with the Quran. Right? You can, inshallah, listen to that. Uh, I'm just going to plug it here. Uh, it's in the comments. Okay. One of my siblings deceased, deceased, but we don't know how many prayers he has missed. How much would you, you just make an assessment? You just make an assessment and do the best that you can. There's no harm in giving a bit more. So you do the best that you can. And may Allah bless you guys. I have been getting gray since in my 20. I'm now in my 40. It is harm to use hair dye. It is not harmful to use hair dye. You can use it if you want to. It's a warning for us. You don't have to show it to the whole world. right? It's a warning for us. You know, I have gray hair. There's nothing wrong in dyeing all right, uh, your hair. In fact, according to one hadith, it's an encouragement to dye. The Prophet saw so Abu Bakr Siddiq and whose father who had flaming white hair or whatever, it was like a lot of white hair. He says, Ghayiruha, like you know, change it. Uh, but just avoid the black. So you're not allowed to use black. You can use a a medium brown or something like that. But you're not allowed to use black. Okay. So don't use black. Right? Please could there be a seminar on how we can make good use of Ramadan spiritually? We've got uh, mashallah, if you go to Zamzam Academy, and I'm sure they will probably do one at uh uh, what's it called miftah anyway right they'll probably do on a miftah anyway but i've got several mashallah seminars uh on uh how to gain ramadanic success on zamzamacademy.com there's several lectures on there for the last several years so inshallah you can definitely benefit from those as well can you ask the dead to forgive the living in prayer or do the living just ask a love forgiveness yeah you can't ask the dead i mean the dead are gone you know you can't you don't communicate with them you talk to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and let allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do the work for you all right and they say that generally if you want to be forgiven by somebody who you can't pay back now you give sadaqah on their behalf you make a lot of dua on their behalf so that on the day of judgment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them satisfied on your behalf in case of the miscarriage does the unborn go to the barzakh everybody goes to the barzakh but then the souls we didn't get to that period uh, that point unfortunately but the souls depending on how a person is if it's a bad person he goes to the sijin if it's a good person and children and so on they go up to the throne around the throne or they go into paradise or at the doors of paradise so it really depends on the individual but the the, the souls of the of, of children they probably buy the throne of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have you seen the picture of the graves in medina of the prophet but if we can't i didn't the prophet's grave right now are we in trouble you don't need to see the graves that there's a marker of the golden uh, you know those golden gates so there's a big round circle on the first one that's in parallel to the prophet sallallahu and then you've got the other two the smaller round ones and that is parallel to abu bakr and umar radiyallahu anhu so there's no problem that you can't see because that as i said that world works in a different way you just have to give your salam i heard a teacher say that we can make dua read something for a non-muslim who has passed away you can't there's nothing that can happen anymore for their salvation you know everything that you could do is beforehand so there's not really much you can do allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran right and uh, there's hadith that are clear about it so i'm not sure uh, you know what uh, the intention was when they said what they said if a convert to islam's father attempts to re-enter her life after nearly 10 years of being completely absent does she have a responsibility towards him if a convert to islam's father attempts to re-enter you always got responsibility towards your father and your mother unless they're harmful to you you're just not allowed to listen to them in anything that's going to be against your faith but if they need your help in terms of money and you can give them money or something uh, some other service and you can do that and it's not going to you know compromise your faith then you should be whether you're muslim, they're muslim or not you have to oblige now if they're violent or if there's some other then then that may be an exception but otherwise, yeah, non-Muslim, Muslim, you uh, the, the, the biological, uh, uh, what do you call it, link there is very, very important. All right. If you've got a more specific, you can actually email us later. 
uh, during the lecture you mentioned cryptocurrency is permissible mobile to invest in you can definitely you know it's mobile to um, uh, for example Bitcoin I don't know about all of the others but I know Bitcoin is okay at the end of the day it's been considered to be an item of value whether it's a good idea or not is a different issue you know um, an investment can be halal but whether it's beneficial or profitable or not that's that's a different issue so I can't answer that question but I can tell you that crypto uh, sorry, Bitcoin for sure is permitted. I haven't looked into the, all the others, so I can't say. Um, it completely unrelated. Someone told me recently that the descendants of Rasulullah can see jinn. Is this true? I've talked to, I know quite a few, I have some good friends. They don't tell me that, so I don't think so. I mean, you could see jinn, right? Anybody can see jinn. It's not necessary that only that. Uh, it's up to Allah who they want to see, and there's certain things that you can actually do to invoke jinn which are not shouldn't be doing that anyway so i don't think it's restricted to that but there are some who can see them and there's some who are not the prophet sallallahu family who can see the jinn the con and you know there's no big achievement in seeing a jinn to be honest right there's no big achievement you're not going to get anything out of it unless bragging rights or something if, it, if the jinn doesn't mess you around any special prayers we can make so that our children can have a righteous spouses um, literally, oh Allah, give them righteous spouses. You know, you make that dua after tahajjud or something. Is there any dua for our siblings be uh, to be righteous? Like there are so many duas for parents and children. Again, the same thing. You just say, oh Allah, make my siblings pious, right? And make me from a pious and righteous family and make my surrounding people pious. Right? If death by COVID or death of a martyr, my mother is not. It depends, right? It depends. She died. If anybody, okay, no more questions after this. If she died, um, uh, if she died due to difficulty, uh, illness, and so on, then generally they are considered to be a martyr of the hereafter, not a martyr of this world. So they're not those whose bodies will not be consumed by the earth, um, but they are martyrs of the hereafter. They'll rise as martyrs. That's entirely up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they died in a serene state, not complaining, and so on, then generally that could be the case. I would like to think that my mother died as a martyr as well about uh, 10, 12 years ago from cancer, suffering from 10 years of cancer. So yes, you can hold a view. But it won't make a difference to her. Allah knows her situation anyway. Inshallah, we'll pray for her as well. Allah bless her. Okay, I think Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Allah bless you all. And uh, we will see you again one day. Um, mashallah, you know, I just want to mention that Rayyan Institute, uh, there's a lot of courses. If you want to understand your deen in, you know, we have White Thread Institute, but that's more for postgraduate stuff. When it comes to uh, regular stuff, we've got... Uh, White uh, Rayyan Institute, which you can go and check, and there's a lot of courses on there. There's the Islamic Essentials course and so on as well. So anyway, I think that's it. There you go. How can we have a chance to speak or email the Miftah? Somebody's provided that. Uh, may Allah accept and make them mujaddis of their time as parents. Our children need to inspire. Yep, Jazakallah, I mean to your duas. Keep us in your duas, and let not this be our last meeting with you guys. May Allah bless these guys at. Uh, Miftah, all the brothers, mashallah. Allah bless them for the great work that they do. Allah bless the rest of your lives and protect you all. And let this pandemic be over. And when this pandemic over, Allah allow us to be stronger than we were when we got into it. Whatever Allah has in store for us, Allah make it good for us. And um, we'll make a short door, inshallah. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabaraki adil jalali wa ikram. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina. محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم يا معدن الجود والكرم يا أكرم الأكرمين يا خير المسؤولين ويا خير المعطين ويا ذا الجلال والإكرام have mercy upon us have يا الله have mercy upon us oh Allah shower us with your forgiveness shower us with your mercy shower us with your generosity with your forbearance with your clemency oh Allah bless all of those who are here all of those who have listened and oh Allah the entire Muslim Ummah Oh Allah, the time, the last two hours that was spent here, oh Allah, make them an accepted one, accepted deed. Oh Allah, make them accepted for all of us. Oh Allah, there's people here who could have been doing so many other things on this Saturday night, this Saturday evening. Oh Allah, we spent it here talking about our lives and you and our deen. Oh Allah, oh Allah, we may have done it without sincerity, with whatever motivation. Oh Allah, make it sincere for you. Oh Allah, accept it from us. And oh Allah, make the rest of our lives better than our previous part of our life. Oh Allah, make every subsequent day of our life better than the previous day of our life and make the best moments of our life best days of our life the final days of our life and make the best moment of our existence the moment that we stand in front of you and love to meet you and you love to
to meet us and oh Allah grant us Jannatul Firdaus and make the stages of all of the hereafter easy for us. Oh Allah bless our loved ones and forgive them and grant them shahada, grant them martyrdom. Oh Allah uh, grant them the status of martyrs and oh Allah protect us from this COVID and from other problems which are out there and from evil old age and allow us to fulfill your rights and to do good deeds and to do the deeds which please you and oh Allah protect us from doing those deeds which are hated in your sight. Oh Allah accept our du'as and oh Allah bless all of those who put these programs together and all the ulama that we have benefited from in order to deliver this to this class. Oh Allah accept from us subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifu wa salamu ala al-musaleen alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen uh, The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that inshallah you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.